Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Ashley. I'm the Volunteer and Outreach Coordinator for NAFA RCD. I'm just going to really quickly um, do a brief introduction to Zoom, just in case anybody hasn't used it before or maybe doesn't know where some of the controls are. Um, so I have muted all of you uh, right off the bat when you enter, just because if you're not all on mute, we get a lot of feedback and it kind of interferes with the sound quality and the video quality um, of the recording that we're doing. Um, and FYI, we are recording this so that it will be available after the fact. Uh, we'll most likely host it on either our YouTube page or the Napa RCD website. Um, and I believe that Miguel is planning on sending it out um, to everybody who is registered um, after the fact as well. So I think it's gonna be available tomorrow on our cloud after it's um, done processing and recording. So we'll make sure and get that out to everybody as well. Uh, for those of you who are new to Zoom, um, there is a chat box. So um, if you kind of hover over the bottom of your screen, for those of you who are new, you should see a little box that says chat. And if you wanna click on that, it should bring up a box on the right-hand side of your screen. For those of you on cell phones, it's gonna look a little bit different and the chat box might not be readily available to you. You might have to kind of swipe through some, um, a couple of different um, like options for your screen. Um, but hopefully everybody is able to see the chat um, anytime throughout the talk. Go ahead and enter a question that you have in there. Um, it will not interrupt anything. Um, it will we'll just kind of accumulate all of the questions and then at the end of each speaker, we'll go ahead and have um, probably Miguel um, ask the questions of our speakers. So um, if anybody has any tech issues or anything like that, uh, feel free to, you know, shoot me a message in, in the chat box, or I think many of you probably have either Miguel's email or my, my own email. Um, so if you have any, any big issues, just let us know and we can see if we can get them all figured out. And with that, I will turn it over to Miguel. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time this lovely morning to join us. We are very excited. Welcome to our second annual Sheep and Grapes workshop. Uh, for those of you who didn't know, we actually did this same or similar workshop last year around this time, and we're very happy that we got an opportunity to do it one more time. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, first of all, I guess I should introduce myself. Sorry, my name is uh, Miguel Garcia. I'm the Sustainable Agricultural Program Manager for the Napa County Resource Conservation District. And for those of you who don't know me, uh, my job is essentially to work with all the great growers to assist them in meeting their sustainable objectives. Uh, one of those is for people interested on incorporating sheep and other animals into their daily operation. So this was a very popular workshop last year. So we decided to bring it back again. One of the things that I wanna mention is like Ashley said, we do have a chat box on the uh, bottom um, of, your, of your screen that will pop out somewhere on the right. Um, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentations. The only thing that I ask you so that we can keep things organized is that you uh, try to ask questions about whoever is presenting at that time. So if you have questions for the presenter, put them on the uh, chat box and I will address them uh, at the end of, the of each presentation. We're gonna have a little bit of time for questions. And then at the end of the day, we're also gonna have uh, time for questioning. And at that time, you can ask uh, anything about any of the presentations. But if you keep your questions to that specific person that is presenting at a time, it will give you an opportunity to keep track of the questions. Uh, we're expecting over 100 uh, plus people today. I just checked it was about 70 of you guys. Thank you so much. So it's going to get a little bit crazy so that, that way I can keep things organized. All right, without further ado, uh, I am very pleased to introduce our first two speakers. We have Amelie Gaudin, which is, uh, she's an assistant professor in agroecology at UC Davis. And we have Kelsey Brewer, which is a PhD student in soil biogeochemistry at UC Davis. Uh, please help me welcome them. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can, can hear me okay. 
Um, I'm delighted to have an opportunity today to be um, sharing some of the insights we've been gaining over time over the last two years on integrated ship vineyard systems in California. And I will be co-presenting today this, this presentation with um, a PhD student working in my lab, Kelsey Brewer, who has been um, interested in looking at the potential for soil health carbon sequestration and um, overall um, sustainability goals. Um, this research is supported by many partners, uh, both nonprofits um, and um, the states um, with uh, active collaborations um, across various institutions um, at UC Davis, UCCE, um, and NAPA RCD, and we're, we're very grateful for um, the great support we've had over the last few years. So um, I just wanted to start by um, thinking a little bit about California and our uh, very diverse agriculture and landscape. Um, uh, yet, uh, various rounds of, of intensification and market pressure have really led to high degree of specialized um, operation and intensification of both specialty crop, animal production, um, and forage and, and feed production. And this is despite the a very interesting connections between these three enterprises. Um, and uh, the management of these systems are often approached separately. And, and that is sometimes hampering our ability to develop regenerative, productive, um, and sustainable systems. So some of the, the, the technologies we've been exploring aim at recoupling crop and livestock production in what we call integrated crop livestock system. So historically, agricultural system produced a diverse set of commodities that, that included both plants and animals um, and exploited the, the tight linkages between animal and crop to maintain productivity. And those systems, were, whether it's dual purpose crops, so grazed crops that are allowed to regrow grow, grazing on residues after crop, cover crop grazing, um, as, as the example we're interested in today, agroforestry systems um, are the backbone of subsistence agriculture, but in sharp decline um, wherever agriculture has become industrialized. And um, it's, it's an interesting set of practices because it can help create a circular or at least semi-circular flow of nutrient um, and energy where material from one enterprise um, serve as an, as an input for another enterprise, such as crop and cover crop residue to feed livestock and livestock manure to fertilize crop um, or um, provide um, pest suppressing um, services. So some of those, those systems that have at recoupling crop and livestock production can uh, make use of ecosystem services provided by animals for production and eventually offset some inputs. And this is a, a, a form of ecological intensification and um, those integrated systems are an integral part of ecological intensification strategy. Um, which aim to replace a portion of, of inputs with services from um, animals in this case. So um, today we'll focus on, on sheep integration in vineyard as a, as a case study as an, and as an example of those integrated crop livestock systems. Um, the general hypothesis when we introduce sheep into vineyards is that it will help with weed control, especially under the vine, um, help control cover crop, um, recycling residue, um, and at the same time, um, starting to build soil health, both the chemical, physical, and biological properties of soy. Um, and that will lead to limiting nutrient losses, whether um, through um, leaching and runoff pathways or whether through greenhouse gas emissions um, with a, a, a negative carbon uh, credit, um, carbon footprint, excuse me, uh, but also provide some uh, potential for pest suppression, enhancing the biodiversity of our landscapes, um, which downstream has the possibility to um, cut on labor and herbicide needs um, and provide new opportunities for climate change mitigation and adaptation in California while maintaining yield and productivities of our systems. So what are the main practices? Um, and Glenn will go over this in a little bit more details, I think. Um, but um, when we think about grazing in vineyard, we're mostly thinking about grazing during winter dormancy, 
Uh, this requires fencing, mowing, um, uh, fencing and, and moving animals between parcels every two or three days. Uh, we tend to study sheep and egg an acre uh, for no more than two three days to limit potential for soil compaction and, and here I just want to mention that we are uh, we've been working with chaos sheep um, um, chaos um, uh, grazers who have an extended experience in, in doing that and so really relying on on the grazers um, and their managers to to do the job here um, it also required designing some specific cover crop mixes um, that would provide adequate feed, and so that's a discussion that is interesting to have um, at, at the beginning when cover crop are, are, are being planted. Some growers have been using sheaf uh, for leaf and sucker removal. This, re this is more precise. Uh, it needs excellent knowledge of, of sheep behavior and uh, tend to be more expensive, but it is an option as well that we've seen implemented across our landscape. And finally, some growers do year-long integration that require higher trellis systems or um, shorter breeds, uh, such as baby doll, which has less common. Um, they're more expensive than regular breed and, and worse less on the meat market. So um, some potential trade-offs here. Most of the industry relies on contractors for grazing and, and uh, we'll be hearing about um, a main contractor here in California um, later in this workshop. So um, what do I want to share with you today is um, some of the insight we've gained from research on the agricultural and environmental outcomes of sheep integration into vineyards in California. In, uh, specifically, uh, we'd like to share with you some of um, our knowledge of the impact of winter sheep grazing of vineyard on soil carbon and soil health. Um, and then, um, um, explore a little bit what are the potential of this practice to offset labor and seasonic inputs based on results we have from other regions and um, share a survey we've done with growers to look at the perception of this practice in California and some of the main barriers and leverages we have identified um, for wider adoption um, that is guiding our research right now. So the first part will be about impact of uh, winter sheep grazing uh, in soil carbon and soil health. And I will um, hand the, the mic over to Kelsey Brewer, a PhD student in, in my lab. Kelsey? Oh, can I, am I heard? Yeah. Yeah, good. Um, so as Amelie was saying, uh, my name is Kelsey Brewer. I've been working um, in Amelie's lab doing integrated crop livestock research, um, specifically kind of focusing on sheep vineyard research for about four years now. Um, so we'll share with you a little bit about this. Um, when we think about these systems, um, we, we tend to start in thinking about them from a point of view of soil carbon. Um, and this is for a few reasons. Um, when we think about soil carbon, we kind of think about soil carbon as a kind of a central variable in soil health kind of meaning that as um, we help to increase or accumulate soil carbon over time, that tends to mean that a lot of other soil health benefits that um, are associated um, tend to increase with carbon. And as carbon decreases, a lot of these soil health benefits decrease as well. So soil carbon, um, first off, is uh, kind of the basis of the soil food web. Um, soil is a living ecosystem composed of you know, many types of organisms, arthropods and earthworms, but also microorganisms, such as bacteria and fungi. Um, and these bacteria and fungi perform lots of very important roles for us in soil that we'll go over a little bit more detail. Um, and again, carbon is, is kind of the basis of that food web. Um, those, that bacteria and fungi is feeding on this carbon and building their biomass, which allows them to conduct these functions. But soil carbon also has a lot of other direct benefits besides just biological. Um, as you can see over here, Chemically, it helps to um, buffer and maintain pH, um, cation exchange, so it helps to absorb and release nutrients for plant uptake. Um, it can be very helpful in helping to reduce um, pollutant or heavy metal toxicity. And then it also is very important in soil structure, so helping to form aggregation and porosity so that water and air can move throughout the soil profile. Um, and of course, it's also a, a reservoir for uh, nutrients. Um, so all this taken into consideration, we see over here on the right that healthy soils are also performing what we call basically ecosystem services. 
So um, as we help to build up carbon over time, we can help to mitigate some maybe negative impacts of, of production, such as uh, erosion control. Um, again, it can, it can help be a reservoir for nutrients and, um, and provide nutrients to plants at critical growth stages. It can filter and store um, increased levels of ground water. Um, so very important for society for us to build soil carbon. So how do we build soil carbon? Well, um, you know, the main mechanism is photosynthesis. So photosynthesis takes CO2 out of the atmosphere, uses solar energy, and it fixes that CO2 into carbon found in the plant in the form of different types of biomolecules, carbohydrates and proteins, plant structural components like lignin and cellulose. These are all composed of carbon um, and they're um, based out of photosynthesis. So when that plant dies, um, and deposits its residues, both the above ground residues and also the roots as the roots start to turn over. This carbon is now entering into the soil ecosystem where it's fed on by the soil microbes that again are conducting some of these very important functions, both for the environment, but also for our production. Um, let's go ahead and move on. So when we're thinking about these integrated uh, sheep vineyard systems and recognizing that carbon is kind of coming from this process of photosynthesis, the next step that we take is kind of thinking about how are sheep impacting um, the ecosystem once they enter into the vineyard and how might they end up having some controls on, on carbon coming into the system. Well, one of the first things that they can do is that um, they can, depending on how you graze, um, you know, the density and duration with which you graze, the periodicity or the, the time, uh, whether that's winter or spring, dormant or, or mid-growing season, it can improve or decrease the productivity of the understory vegetation, um, in this case, cover crop. So certain grazing practices can actually increase the productivity of the cover crop. Um, it can also obviously impact the biodiversity of the cover crop. Sheep will preferentially feed on certain types of species. Um, depending on the grazing practices, it will promote the proliferation of certain types of species. So this has massive impact on um, the quantity of residues that are returned, but also the quality of the residues that are returned. You know, are we having um, a cover crop composition that's predominantly composed of legumes that are fixing lots of nitrogen into the system? Um, also, it, it could impact the, the root architecture and the, the functional diversity of the root system. Um, the act of grazing can also shift the way that um, carbohydrates are allocated within the forage, meaning that they can kind of shift some of the carbohydrates towards uh, root production and more ro robust root production. There's some benefits of that potentially where um, greater root systems will be depositing larger amounts of carbon into the soil system, but also maybe deeper because these root systems have had more investment. Um, they might be kind of exchanging nutrients with the microbial community. Um, and lastly, obviously, the introduction of sheep into a vineyard converts a lot of this understory vegetation into dung and urine, um, a different form of carbon, oftentimes has uh, nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus that are um, in inorganic forms and much more bioavailable for immediate uptake. So it can uh, maybe change the, the fertility of the soil. There's the trampling effect of the sheep that might incorporate some of this vegetation in. There might be some trade-offs such as compaction. So, so one of the ways that we went about um, answering some of these questions and framing our research initially was that we conducted a survey of three paired sites. Um, one of these sites, um, so, so across, across uh, Napa, Sonoma, um, and also Lake County. Um, one, one of these uh, sites for each of these paired locations had been grazed by sheep for 10 or more years. And then uh, a neighboring vineyard that had never been integrated before. Um, these vineyards had the same uh, vine clonal variety, the same rootstocks, same soil texture and slope, really similar co-management strategies. Um, but one vineyard had been integrated with sheep for 10 or more years and the other was, was non-integrated. So Again, kind of going back to soil carbon, our first question was, well, was there a change in soil carbon with the integration of sheep for 10 or more years? And, and this graph right here is showing basically a percent change in soil organic carbon between the integrated and non-integrated vineyards, where this red bar right here represents the average soil organic carbon for the vineyards that were not integrated. And these bars represent a positive change in soil organic carbon. 
So as we can see as an average across all three of these locations in the zero to 10 or zero to 15 centimeter um, depth, we saw essentially almost uh, an entire percent increase in soil organic carbon in vineyards that had been grazed. And this trend kind of continued as we move further into depth, uh, 15 to 30 centimeters and 30 to 45 centimeters, we still see this trend of increasing soil organic carbon in integrated vineyards. Um, so again, kind of thinking about soil organic carbon as the basis of the soil food web and thinking about these microbes that are living in the soil and the fact that these, these microbes are conducting really key functions for us. Um, functions that we're really looking for as producers. So they, they, they certainly um, decompose residues and they help to cycle those residues and ultimately form this stable soil organic carbon pool that we're talking about. So the stable soil organic carbon pool um, is derived from microbes. They also will feed on that soil organic carbon pool as kind of a reserve of food if they don't have residues coming in to the system. Um, in addition to decomposing those residues, they are also recycling the nutrients that are found into those residues um, and they're converting them into bioavailable inorganic forms, our nitrates and ammoniums for nitrogen, our phosphates. Um, they're also helping to take some of those nutrients and store them more long term. So they can store them in the microbial biomass, they can store them in the soil organic carbon that they're forming and that helps to maybe reduce losses of say nitrogen to leaching or erosion as well. Um, these microbes, um, as they're decomposing the residues, they kind of secrete these glue-like substances that help to bind um, soil particles into aggregates and, and help to improve soil structure, soil porosity. Um, and then they also, we know that a lot of these microbes um, have real direct relationships to plant health and productivity. Um, such as like symbiotes that we might be more familiar with, such as like mycorrhizal fungi, um, that creates a symbiosis with plant roots, vine roots, and helps um, mine the soil for water and phosphorus, amongst other things. Uh, rhizobia with some of our understory vegetation um, legumes to help fix nitrogen and add more nitrogen into the system. And, and also potentially um, control of soil-borne pathogens. Um, these microbes maybe can outcompete potential pathogens and help uh, reduce potential breakouts. Um, so what we did see was in the integrated vineyards in our survey study, um, across all three sites, we saw a significant increase in microbial biomass in the integrated treatments compared to the non-integrated treatments. So we saw this increase in soil organic carbon at multiple depth zones, and then we saw subsequently an increase in microbial biomass from the integrated system. So kind of um, looking at this survey and, and uh, an overview of the various uh, results that we saw, um, we saw a lot of potential significant benefits. We saw the accumulation of soil carbon, we saw a significant increase in microbial biomass, and then we start looking at some of these functions that the microbes are actually conducting. Well, we see that the total amount of nitrogen in the integrated system was higher. And not just the total amount of nitrogen, but also the um, bioavailable fraction, um, the, the nitrates and ammoniums that were available for plant uptake. We also saw an increase in um, plant available phosphorus. Um, and we also saw a kind of increase in microbial activity related to uh, residue turnover rates. So we saw that the residues of the under, understory vegetation, they weren't sitting around on the soil for long periods of time. They were, they were being first processed by the sheep and converted into dung and manure, and then they were quickly processed by the microbes into stable organic carbon. So we saw that the microbes that are conducting these functions, that we saw a relative increase in the population of, of fun, fungus, fungi compared to bacteria. Um, and kind of these fungi um, for us, uh, uh, an increase in fungi is usually associated as kind of an indicator of improvements in soil health. Fungi tend to be a more stable form of microbe than bacteria. And the proliferation of fungi tends to give us an indication that, that other indi indicators of soil health are improving. Um, we also saw some potential trade-offs. Um, you know, uh, dung and urine is, is fairly concentrated in, in salts and uh, is being deposited right there on the soil surface. So there is a potential trade-off of salinity. Um, now, over the course of this uh, survey project with these vineyards that had been grazed for 10 or more years, we never saw any kind of salinity levels that were in danger of impacting plant productivity or health or yield or anything. But it is notable that in um, 
potentially salt impacted soils, uh, salinity could be a, a potential trade off. Compaction. Um, in some of our sites, we saw, you know, some trends that, that showed maybe a little bit of increased compaction from grazing. But in other sites, we actually saw reductions in compaction um, that might be related again to this kind of um, increase in root activity um, from the action of grazing and also this improvement in soil structure, this like particle aggregation that might actually be helping to reduce compaction in the integrated systems. And then another potential consideration was um, this leachable plant available nitrogen fra fraction. We saw an increase in nitrate and ammonium, which is good for the bioavailability of nitrogen for uh, vine uptake, but it also does potentially increase the, the leaching of nitrogen of the field because so much of this nitrogen is bioavailable at a given time. Um, there's a couple uncertainties. We still really don't know exactly what's happening with water dynamics in the field. Um, and we require a lot more information to really assess the adaptation and mitigation potential of the system for climate change. So we're currently um, in year two of a replicated trial study at the uh, Napa RCD Huachica Creek demonstration vineyard. Um, you can see we have this little slice of about, I think uh, two and a half acres or so, um, blocks A and B over at the demonstration vineyard. Um, and uh, so we, we conducted our first grazing here um, with a Chaos Sheep Outfit, um, and I think Robert and or Jamie Irwin from that group is going to be talking to you a little bit later today. Um, they started grazing last year. Uh, we just finished our second year of grazing um, recently, uh, about maybe a half a month ago or so. Um, this site also has a co-management gradient um, of 23 years that has been in place for 23 years where every other row is tilled and every other row is no-till. And those tilled rows have a planted cover crop, um, a kind of mixed legume grain cover crop, and the no-till rows have this kind of uh, native vegetation growth that occurs. And so we graze um, the sheep during dormancy on both these tilled and no-tilled rows and um, kind of exploring a little bit of the outcomes of that. So kind of thinking about how we use this survey study to build on our ideas of what we're looking at, um, kind of, you know, we had focused a lot on soil health, recognizing that soil health has a lot of um, impacts on, on crop productivity and yield. Um, but also, you know, the sheep themselves are kind of this large scale ecological tool that we can use. So there's the potential maybe um, to displace um, large amounts of mechanization using um, animals. As you can see from this photo here on the top right, um, on the right hand side we have this very short forage, um, where on the left hand side we have kind of a full grown cover crop. This right hand side, this, so this is a photo from um, our demonstration vineyard Huachica Creek uh, from this year. And as you can see that um, this is about uh, a week or two before um, we ended up coming in and mowing and terminating the, the non-grazed rows. But these grazed rows over here on the right hand side, I mean, you know, there, there's a, a likelihood that we wouldn't even really need to go in and, and till those um, after grazing. Um, so, I mean, when we're looking at, at what's happening with the sheep, we're kind of thinking about it from three different tiers. The first one is kind of thinking about the, the vines themselves their health and productivity. So we're taking a look obviously at like, you know, vine nutrition. We're taking a look at, at various stress indicators of the vineyard, including water stress. Um, and we're taking a look at the berry quality and the yield um, and seeing if and how sheep might impact, be impacting these, these metrics of vineyard uh, health and productivity. We're also taking a really close look at this understory vegetation in the vineyard and the dynamics of how it's affected by sheep grazing. So we're looking at the composition of the forage and how the composition might change as a result of grazing. We're looking at the productivity, um, remembering that really ultimately the amount of carbon that's coming into the system is a product of photosynthesis and therefore a product of the productivity of the biomass on a field. So if we can increase the productivity of this forage, and put more carbon back into the system, that's gonna be our best way of driving up soil organic carbon. Um, we're also taking a look at the quality of the forage, um, the leaf carbon and nitrogen content, and then also the uh, mid-season weed pressure to see if um, the introduction of grazing and cover cropping um, actually helps to reduce mid-season weed pressure. Then we're taking a look um, again at soil, kind of we've, we've honed a little bit of our metrics that we're taking a look at, added some of them for more complexity. And we're taking a look at um, a lot of various soil carbon, soil biology, soil physical and chemical metrics 
And we're trying to tie all three of these levels together and kind of trying to see where there might be some cause and effect uh, implications and ultimately uh, kind of the outcomes of, of sheep on, on these various metrics of sustainability and productivity for vineyard producers. Thanks, Kelsey. So um, this research is, is uh, in its second year, and so we, we hope to be able to share more, more results soon, but, but we do see an impact on soil health, and we do see a potentially long-term um, potential for building soil health and sequestering carbons in our soils. Um, so what is the potential to offset labor and synthetic inputs? And we do not have this um, information in California quite yet. Um, and so I want to share with you some results from um, a trip I've, I've uh, taken with some of my colleagues in, in New Zealand uh, to better understand the potential of those system. And um, it's a real inspiration when it comes to um, integrated sheep vineyard system. 100% of farmers uh, actually integrate sheep uh, during dormancy in their vineyards. 13% um, of farmer use sheep uh, for uh, what they call leaf plucking, which is leaf removal and, and um, sucker removal later in the season. And 7% of farmer actually use sheep in the vineyard year round. Um, with, with a colleague of mine, Meredith Nice, uh, from uh, the University of, of Vermont and, and some others have published um, a summary of the ecological and economic benefits of integrated sheep into viticulture production um, in New Zealand. And this publication is available for all of you to um, look and read through. Uh, online. So I just wanted to raise your attention here and some of um, the results that they she they've seen um, were mostly when talking with, with grower. Um, they asked them what were the perceived beneficial changes of this practice. Um, all grower mentioned reduced um, uh, mowing and herbicide used. Um, some of them mentioned uh, benefits for uh, frost protection from controlling the, the cover crop. Um, nitrogen used 27% of the of the grower offset their their nitrogen based on um, nutrient inputs from the sheep, um, and then a few of them have, have um, felt benefits uh, around their marketing strategies um, and decreasing their fuel use and 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 other inputs. Some other mentioned benefits in in these studies and that are um, are. Um, growers from New Zealand have, have expressed is the um, additional grass for, for grazing, um, especially in winter, so providing some opportunities across the landscape for um, forage and maintaining um, a, a diverse landscape, which includes animals, um, especially when it's um, a challenging time of drought, um, by helping out those who need feed as well. Um, and so benefits were, were also mentioned, but were definitely not in the top a few things that grower would be mentioning uh, when um, thinking about the perceived beneficial changes of this practice. In terms of cost saving, uh, most of the savings in those landscapes were from um, labor and input cost. On average, um, it was measured that growers um, save 2.2 fewer mows annually, um, which can be pretty significant. Um, and those are numbers for New Zealand um, labor. And so it might be likely different in, in our context, but um, fewer mows um, and an average uh, one to 1.3 fewer herbicide application, which is also um, extra savings for growers. So we asked growers in California, what do they think about this practice? Uh, because we wanted to start developing a research agenda that was tailored to our own set of constraints and, and, and production systems. Um, and asked them what are the main barriers to adopting this practice so that we can start identifying some levers to adoption. We uh, interviewed uh, 20 growers across California and um, we uh, looked at their perceptions um, of this practice. And 
those growers were adopters and non-adopters. Um, the limiting labor for mowing is certainly an attractive um, aspect of this practice, as well as limiting herbicide and or fuel use. Something very unique to um, California is um, fire prevention. That was something that um, was um, increasingly of, of interest to growers for understandable reasons. Um, and also providing some uh, marketing aspects, especially for larger wineries. Um, but interestingly and surprisingly, social cultural dimensions uh, were uh, very strong, meaning that growers that are interested in sheep grazing do it because um, they have a genuine interest in biodiversity. Um, as well as um, um, sustainability and reducing their footprint um, while um, harnessing some of those other benefits for fire prevention, cutting down labor and herbicide and improving soil quality. Some barriers though um, that were very useful for us to start thinking about the next steps of those research is that we know very little about optimal management of the animals to maximize benefits in those systems. And I think knowledge is coming in and, and, and uh, contractors um, have been um, um, have more and more experience into working in those systems. Um, so this is something that is increasingly being addressed. But in general, there's still a lack of advising and training on how to manage sheep in vineyards. Um, something that comes up a lot in our California context is the risk of soil compaction, uh, potentially is, is a perceived barrier by, by many growers and something we still need to um, better understand as a function of animal management. And then finally, dam damaging of irrigation drip tapes, uh, which is a, a trade-off um, that might occur and it will vary with the type of irrigation um, uh, being used, but um, that can be offset as well through redesign of systems um, and, tra and training of sheep and sheep management. Um, so what growers suggested to us is to start uh, putting together a network of contractors and, and producers. And this is something that uh, UC Sarep uh, will be taking on, um, starting building this um, platforms for both contractors and producers to meet, exchange information, but also creating a virtual marketplace um, to promote those, those interaction and adoption of this practice. And then continue filling in the information gap. Um, we're um, uh, completing our ecological and economic cost benefits is still missing and I think that uh, um, the, the research platform we're working at right now is is going to yield some very interesting results in the next few years that uh, we can use to have a more comprehensive view of the both the ecological and economic costs and benefits. Um, and then start doing some more practical training and workshop about this practice, both in terms of sheep and vineyards, uh, um, of just uh, management. Um, one thing uh, that we need to start thinking about and harness growers' innovations here is how do we redesign our vineyards uh, for new plantings? What should a vineyard look like in terms of trellis with irrigation um, so that uh, integration can be done in um, the best ways? And then uh, introduce some of those uh, these practices into uh, by creating market mechanisms and, and including them in certain certification schemes, um, which it is sometimes. So those are some very active area of research and, and a roadmap for us um, to um, continue working collectively toward getting this practice evaluated and creating opportunities for growers um, to implement it um, and optimize it for their specific, specific systems and, and production constraints or, or um, context. Um, but I think we have an unprecedented opportunities here. Um, cover crops have been a success in vineyards uh, that provides a source of forage. Um, we have low to no concerns about food safety. So one of the best system to be started to think about animal reintegration. Uh, we have an industry that has been showing extreme interest in this practice and some growers have been innovating in this realm and we have um, a little bit of knowledge. Uh, we've 
you know, the, those we sampled as at, at orchards that have been grazed for more than 10 years. So a, a lot of experience that can be harnessed there. And then finally, we have a local policy context that is uh, incentivizing some new ways of improving soil health and, and maybe um, uh, reintegration of animals in our system provide a way of doing that while um, better using animal services to offset some inputs. With that, I'll thank you for your attention. We'll be taking some questions. Um, and I want to acknowledge our funding agencies. We're very grateful for um, Shed and CDFA, CAF, um, for um, their support, as well as Napa RCD, um, some colleagues in France that have helped us with um, the survey, um, and UC Davis and the Department of uh, Plant Science in particular. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily and Kelsey. I really appreciate your perspective. For those of you that join us uh, during the middle of the presentation, we are taking questions. Uh, just go ahead and type them on the group chat. Uh, it should be a button at the bottom of your screen where you can type your questions. Before I address that really quick, uh, just like Kelsey mentioned, the part of this, this study has been conducted in Wichita Creek Vineyard, which is a vineyard owned by the Napa RCD. We have been doing it for two years now, and we want to encourage anybody that would like to visit and take a look at what we're doing, or if you have more questions about how we address it. We had never grazed sheep in the past, so we are relatively new to it and we're learning as we're going as well. And of course, Emily and Kelsey are managing the project. So it's a little bit easier that way. So addressing the question of cost, one of the things that I can mention is that yes, we did substituted mowing for grazing. Uh, whether the cost is being addressed or not, that's a different question. And the problem for that is that we don't have many local companies that will bring the sheep to you. We are working with Chaos Grazing and we'll be uh, honored to have Robert Irwin later today speaking about that. Uh, but some people might be asking about what if I wanna own my own sheep? So later on, we're gonna have uh, uh, Dr. Stephanie Larson from Youth Cooperative Extension in Sonoma talking a little bit about that, what it is to own your own sheep. I think the question here is uh, the more people get interested on it, I think, uh, we're going to have more of these companies bringing the sheep to us and as more people do it the cost will go down if you're just one person doing it in your community then it's going to be difficult to find someone but uh, i think the interest is increasing and the industry will catch up with that so i just wanted to mention that uh, we have one question here uh, we have what metrics are you using for berry quality have you seen any change in berry quality, change in bricks, nutritional content? Yeah, um, I can take that one. Um, the, the general measurements that we're looking at in berry quality, and if you have a recommendation, by all means, please, please do say, um, we're, we're looking at pH and, and the levels of various acids in, um, in the berry. We're also looking at uh, sugar levels um, and berry nitrogen content. Those are the big ones we're looking at. Well, we haven't seen a difference yet. Again, we're only just starting our second year. Um, COVID has certainly thrown a little bit of a wrench in some of our sampling um, and analysis, um, but we're hoping to get back on there real soon. Um, but yeah, I mean, these things that might cause changes in berry quality that, um, that are starting at the soil level, we're, we're starting to see some of these changes in the soil level. Um, certainly uh, changes in available nutrient content like nitrogen that, that we're assuming might result in changes in berry quality, but we haven't picked that up yet. And you guys are interested also in yield, right, Kelsey? Yeah, also looking at yield as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we haven't seen any, any differences quite yet, but um, something that we're tracking and, and we're hoping to, by working with the Napa City and this vineyard, the advantage is that we're hoping to keep this practice going on over the longer term than just a research grant. So kind of look at longer term um, trends in, in yields and berry quality and soil also take time to, soil ecosystem take time to, to shift. Absolutely. Uh, another thing that I want to mention is that uh, be aware that we broke down this workshop into two days. Originally, we were going to do it in person. It was going to be a whole day event. We split it into two. So the second part of this workshop will happen next Friday. And that day, we're going to have a panel of growers. 
So you'll get an opportunity to ask them, uh, how is their experience utilizing the sheep? We're gonna have a grower, uh, Jake from Somerston, who they use it for fire prevention, not so much for grazing in the vineyard. We're gonna have uh, also somebody from Robert Sinsky Vineyards, which they use them for grazing. And we're also gonna have Kelly, uh, who actually use them year round. So we'll get an opportunity to ask uh, a lot more in-depth questions about that. Uh, one more question, is there a schedule release date for your contractor network? I wish. Um, no, there's, we, we don't have this quite yet. This is something that we've written in year three of the grant. So we'll be um, starting to think about this um, starting 2021. Um, uh, toward the end of, of the project, but we, we've made some contacts and, and we now have a better understanding of the different players in this field um, to be able to build an effective platform to connect people. So I think, I think probably next year. Good. So we'll have uh, Robert Irwin from Chaos later today. So you'll get an opportunity to ask a little bit more questions about uh, what's in the area. They come from Lake County. So as you can imagine, transportation costs will be a little bit higher. We contracted with them, uh, things are going really well, but it, it, is, it is what it is, that we don't have anybody in Napa County that does that. So stay tuned for that as well. And we, we, we're gonna be able to ask them questions about their costs and their protocols. Uh, another question, is anyone investigating the animal performance component? Um, that's a very interesting question. I know of, of some research elsewhere um, in, in France and New Zealand, especially when it comes down to toxicity of some of the inputs on, on the vine on, for, for sheep. Um, but uh, in our context, uh, we are not working with animal scientists um, uh, to look at look at this aspect there's certainly something that I, I would love to get some some animal scientists interested in this practice and so we can build something a little bit more holistic in terms of how we assess the outcome of the systems yeah there is some research in other types of integrated crop livestock systems that in more depth look at animal performance um, some of the systems come out of brazil especially um, you know it's a consideration that we have in the in the kind of the thought process and the design of these vineyard systems that would integrate sheep when considering an ideal cover crop composition, um, a cover crop composition that would be ideal for, you know, bolstering certain soil functions, but also a cover crop composition that, that would be ideal from a sheep uh, nutritional value of protein and, and everything like that. Okay. Somebody else is asking, is there any increase in vine water stress? Um, so again, we are only in year two. We are looking at a lot of various uh, components of water, the water system in the entire vineyard, um, water storage in the soil, infiltration of water movement through the soil profile, and then ultimately um, potential water stress in the vines. We haven't seen anything yet, um, any notable differences. But one of the hopes would be that uh, if uh, sheep grazing in vineyards is in fact a practice that helps accumulate in um, uh, more soil organic carbon, that that soil organic carbon should ultimately have a beneficial impact on water storage and water stress. Do you guys know if the integration of sheep qualifies for the Healthy Soil Program grant? Not yet. Okay. We're kind of like almost edging our way there, you know, like rotational grazing or, or kind of like um, uh, prescription grazing has been integrated now into the healthy soils. Uh, cover cropping is part of it, um, and maybe thinking about sheep grazing in vineyards as a cover crop termination methodology, kind of thinking back to that slide where we were looking at the differences between the right hand and the left hand of a field that had had been grazed. Um, sheep is a pretty effective termination methodology for cover crops. Yeah, so I mean, it, it will get there. Uh, the feedback we've got from CGFA is that um, we don't know enough about whether it improves soil health or not quite yet. So that's why we um, did not wait for our trial and started to do this survey study um, so that we can gather results from field that have been grazed for a long time so we can um, estimate 
uh, and measure impacts on soil health to feed back to CDFA and eventually if you know we do see some positive results on soil health um, so um, we'll be um, we'll be communicating with, with CDFA once this study is published and has passed the peer review process that we need in science to, um, to make sure that uh, everything is, is okay and accurate. So something we've, we've been working on to get this practice out there. Um, the, the challenge is, is that the soil health out outcome are very tightly dependent on grazing uh, management. And so there's a lot of viability, but I think even with this viability across our sites, we see an increase in soil carbon in the top soil layers. Uh, we do see constant shifts in microbial biomass and microbial diversity. So fostering some very key indicators of soil health. So um, something that we'll be busy with, which is communicating with CDFA so that we can really clarify this practice of as a cover crop termination strategy um, to uh, build um, soil health as well. Okay. We have uh, another question here. Are there any food safety issues? Um, I don't think it's, it's a major problem for um, uh, wine production, um, and that's why uh, we decided to work in the systems first. Um, uh, it's winter grazing for the most part, and, and the berries don't, don't touch the soil. Um, those integrated systems um, might uh, be a little bit more complicated in, in vegetable annual crops or um, some other orchard crops um, that are harvested. Uh, from from the soil, um, but I think we have some pretty good guidelines right now. Uh, we're doing research on uh, sheep grazing of cover crop in tomato systems, and and um, we're starting to see the dynamics of E. coli and and other pathogens in the soil, and the fact that the guidelines of um, having um, three plus months uh, between grazing and harvesting of a crop is is enough um, to alleviate. Um, any food safety concern that um, growers might have in terms of um, annual crop production. But um, we haven't done this, this research on vineyard because it's less relevant in this case. Thank you. All right, we still have a couple more minutes for questions, so I still encourage you to uh, keep shooting questions at us if you have some. Uh, the next question asks, are typical vineyard chemicals being used on your plots? Miguel, do you want to take this question maybe? I can talk about our uh, trial at Wichita Creek. Uh, we are currently managing our vineyard organically, although we are not certified um, as anybody else farming in Carneros. We have a lot of millweed and, um, I'm sorry, a lot of millibog, and we want to make sure that we keep some tools available in case we have a big event and we cannot get rid of them any other way. Um, but we are more or less managing organically. Um, so we, we don't use Roundup, we use only mechanical weeding. Um, so nothing out of the ordinary. I guess this question is addressed for the concerns on sheep safety. Uh, we will have Dr. Uh, Stephanie Larson later on talking about the sheep physiology and how to take care of them. So I'm gonna keep, uh, unless you, Emily or Kelsey, have anything else to add, I'm gonna keep this question aside from when her 20% is. Yeah, that's fine, Miguel, thank you. Yeah, that sounds okay. good. Okay, so we'll leave this question for Dr. Larson a little later. So I'm keeping track of all the questions here, so I won't forget about it. Okay, our next question is, is your research only going to be in the winter season? When did the sheep go in and come out? So for our study, uh, I'll take the first uh, portion of it. For our study, we have them twice. We have them at uh, the beginning of January and at the beginning of March. And the key with uh, timing it, um, of course, if, there, if it's raining a lot, then you have to worry about compaction, the sheep not being able to come in and out which we had some rains in January, March, it was dry as a bone, so we really didn't have an issue. You did need to get them out before bud break, of course, because otherwise you'll see more damage. Uh, we'll hear from Kelly uh, next Friday about how they are integrating sheep year round in the vineyard and how they are making it work. Uh, but for us, we just try to get them out um, 
right before bad break. All right. The next question is, what market mechanisms are you considering to encourage adoption? So I'm, I'm an ecologist and an agronomist, so very far away from my area of expertise here talking about markets. Um, but I think there's some opportunities and this is um, for um, certification schemes and, and also direct marketing of, you know, just using this, this beautiful idea of having sheep in your vineyards um, to um, uh, show your clientele. Um, and um, that's, you know, we, we, need to, we need to think about this as scientists because this is gonna be a primary leverage for, for adoption. So we're, um, uh, that's something that we'll initiate in, in the last leg of this, we should starting to um, share our results with uh, certification agencies, with other people you're involved in, into marketing your wines, so that try to, so that those benefits, but, but also contract grazers, so that um, some of those potential benefits can be used to communicate about um, sheep grazing in vineyards and created an added market values for, for the product if this is something that um, growers and are, are interested in. So our job is to create the knowledge so that um, uh, this can be taken later on to create new, new market uh, opportunities and mechanisms, both for grazers and contractors and for growers alike. Yes. So I didn't answer your question, sorry. <laughs> I mean, uh, a, a, large, <clears throat> a large part of our study is looking at <clears throat> potential of sheep to be able to uh, offset external inputs. So, you know, if, if sheep are hypothetically resulting in improvements in water capture and water storage, can irrigation be held off longer? Can there be savings involved in water and fertilizer and um, other kinds of components of the vineyard that might be a kind of cost and associated market benefit of integrating sheep as well? Right, and, and so we've been working with, with some growers um, in other part of the world who want to put a price tag on some of those benefits, including carbon sequestration, um, decreasing erosion, etc. So I think it's a little bit premature to do that right now, given the extent of knowledge we have. But, um, you know, start valuing some of those ecosystem services could provide some added um, um, uh, strategies for, for marketing and, and, and added value on the product. And again, uh, next Friday, we're gonna be having the panel of growers. So we'll get an opportunity to talk to them about how it's benefiting their own business. Um, I will tell you from our experience, uh, when we brought the sheep, uh, we had a lot of neighbors kind of peeking around the fence and taking pictures. Uh, later on, we had a, a volunteering event uh, and people really enjoy looking at the sheep. Um, I, I don't know if it's just my experience, but driving around Napa, we don't see a lot of sheep. So it's, it definitely catches your eye. So I will tell you that at least we'll make people turn and wonder what the sheep are doing in your vineyard. And then if you have tasting, um, maybe not right now, but when everything resumes back, if you have tasting and you have the sheep there, uh, maybe it brings another appeal um, to your operation. But luckily, uh, we're doing this study and hopefully we'll be able to do some cost benefit analysis at some point and see what the true financial benefits to this will be. But people do like this kind of thing. Uh, and I think that we are very lucky to work in this area of California because we get a lot of tourists. So there might be people that really like the sheep and they want to take a, a closer look. Um, Let's see, we have another, or we have a follow-up question. It says the chemical question was focused more on soil health. For example, use of fungicides would be expected to inhibit fungi establishment and presumably the ability to sequester carbon. Right, yeah, we're not using anything to the best of my knowledge, anything like fungicides or anything like that. Not, um, it, not at our vineyard in Wichita, no, we are not. Yeah, it, but, but also our, our grazing trial is taking place over an established kind of uh, co-management uh, gradient, where like I was saying, we, we have an alternative row tillage that's in, been implemented for about 24 years now, and that uh, tilled rows are 
uh, with a planted cover crop composition and no-till rows are with a resident vegetation composition. So we're kind of like looking at the impact of grazing um, in the context of multiple different types of co-management variability as well. All right, thank you. So with that, we're gonna move over to the next section. Uh, we, you're gonna get an opportunity to ask questions again for Kelsey and Emily at the end uh, of the workshop, if you choose to do so. But for now, we're gonna move on to our next speaker. We're lucky here to have Glenn McCourty, who is the uh, County Director of Viticulture and Plant Science Advisor for the UC Cooperative Extension in Mendocino County. And Glenn is going to be talking a little bit more about the benefits of grazing sheep in vineyards. Good morning, everybody. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay. All right. Well, uh, this is a nice celebration for a gray day here in Mendocino County. And we've been Sorry, kind Glenn. of this. Glenn, we cannot see your, uh, your screen yet. OK. Hold on while we troubleshoot this. We're still pretty much on time, so don't worry about it. Is that bringing it up? Not yet. Almost. Ah, there we go. So now just start okay. the slide and you're good to go. How about that? Perfect. Okay. Well, good morning. So uh, Mendocino County is kind of a, a center of, of sort of a hotbed for environmentally friendly farming. And uh, we've, we've done a lot of really interesting things over the years with organic and biodynamic farming. And it's because people who live here tend to have a real interest in the environment. And you know, where I came from, I started my career in agronomy, and uh, what I saw as pasture species also made really good cover crops, and that's why very early on I got interested in this, because I knew these plants from uh, another point of view, which was that they uh, are good pasture species, but they also, a lot of them are really well suited for growing in a vineyard, and they're sort of prime cuts as, a, as it goes to sheep feed. So some of them make excellent no-till uh, feed or cover crops, such as the subterranean clovers and, and other self-receding annual plants that just will grow on their own with rainfall. And we just happen to have sheep in Mendocino County. And this is one of my heroes. This is Sarah bennett Kahn, and she and her parents uh, started their uh, vineyard careers actually with, with sheep and uh, Ted, Bennett and Deborah Kahn moved to Mendocino County in 1971 wanting to have a sheep ranch and discovered they needed to have something else on the side so they started planting grapes and over the years they, they uh, created Navarro vineyards but then Sarah as she grew up was always interested in sheep she had been in 4-H and everything and she was one of the first to really go after the baby doll sheep and uh, they, they uh, work well in the vineyard because they're quite small but she took it to the next step and decided you should really just design your whole vineyard for, for grazing so you have the flexibility of putting them out there any time. And it's pretty easy to do. You just put your canopy up high. It's a little bit more expensive to install. But essentially, she can uh, manage her vineyard floor with no tractors whatsoever. And, and uh, she uses the sheep not only for meat, but she also makes cheese. And if you haven't visited Pennywell Farm in Anderson Valley, you should see it someday. And, and do a wine and sheep tasting because both are excellent. So these are some of the useful tools for managing sheep, electric fences, because we're gonna intensively graze and we use them. It's a process that New Zealanders and Australians call mob stocking, which means that you put a lot of sheep in at once, you graze intensively and then move them on. And under those kinds of circumstances, they act just like a mower. Uh, guard dogs are pretty essential because we have coyotes all around us and coyotes love lamb as much as we do. Border collies are kind of used to move the animals around. You're going to need a gun because there's going to be problems. Uh, hopefully you won't get into too many, but uh, coyotes and, and the neighbor's dogs all find sheep kind of interesting. And barbecue is pretty nice. You can actually uh, 
uh, barbecue your mower at the end of the season if you want. And uh, lamb is a wonderful natural uh, product that doesn't have to be feedlotted, so it's very healthy for you and, uh, and delicious besides. So portable electric fencing is one solution. Uh, you know, the, the whole thing started really with grazing sheep and vineyards back in the 1970s when the vineyards were deer fenced and it was discovered that you could put the uh, sheep in there in the fall for lambing and they were quite protected of, against predators. But uh, deer fencing is quite expensive to put up and actually you don't need to. Electric fencing like this works really, really well. It, it can be put out quickly and I'm gonna let probably Jamie and Rob go over that a little bit more, but just to mention it's a really important tool so that you could rapidly fence an area. These things can be put out with an ATV and, and you can fence up uh, a cell as we call it very quickly for the sheep. Uh, and you usually set the cells up uh, in a way that they can graze everything down fairly rapidly. And the dogs are amazing. So they, the two different types of dogs, the guard dog on the right, Great Pyrenees we, and uh, Akbash and others, we just refer to them as big white dogs. And then you have border collies and uh, I've owned a border collie. They're really interesting animals. Um, they're very smart, uh, but they have to have something to do or they're gonna get into trouble. But this is really kind of a little circus when you bring all these animals together. And here's Ted Bennett at Navarro Vineyards. He's going over the daily assignments with the dogs. And you literally have that kind of uh, uh, connection with the animals. The border collies are extremely uh, interested in you and they really want to please. Uh, the white dogs are uh, a little less interested, but they tend to stay with the sheep and their job is to bark at anything that comes near the flock. And uh, to coyotes, they can't really tell them apart from the sheep because they only see black and white and from a distance they look like the sheep. So that's why it works out pretty good. This is a picture of uh, sheep coming into my vineyard. I do use sheep and grazing on our uh, seven acres of vines at, at my ranch, Spirit Canyon. And this was last year, um, Rob and Jamie's flock coming down the road. And here you see the sheep and they're creating a little cloud of mist because it had just rained and they're moving pretty quick. They're probably moving around uh, 10 to 15 miles an hour. And there's the white dog and there's the border collie. Whoops, I'm gonna go back. Okay, sorry about that. And you can see the border collie's got lots of energy and is really running fast and, and the white dog's going a little bit slower paced, but that's pretty typical. There they are at work. So uh, this is very intensively gray. So we had 450 sheep in my uh, seven acres for about two days. And uh, that's what you want. You want them to get in there so that they're, they're really hungry and they eat everything. Uh, they, take, they take down not only the forage, but they also take down the weeds. So when they're finished, things are left pretty clean. Uh, there we are in 2019, looking at them from the road. So again, my deer fencing, uh, Rob and Jamie like grazing where I am because it's quite safe for the sheep uh, because we, we can uh, exclude pretty much anything we don't want in there. This is what it looks like after 24 hours. So on the left, you can see where it wasn't grazed and on the right, you can see where it's grazed. And uh, they are taking it down to look like a golf course by the time that they're finished. And here it is post grazing. So this is set up really well for two things. One is for under the vine cultivation, which I farm my vineyard using organic practices, even though I'm not certified because I find most wineries are more interested in the quality of the fruit than they are on certification. And uh, the other thing that's really important benefit from this too is that I've done a lot of research on, on uh, frost and the interaction between vineyard floor and cover crops. And there's uh, ice degrading bacteria that live on the surface of most of our cover crops. And if we can get those numbers down, we can lower the temperature at which uh, grapevine tissue will freeze by as much as two to three degrees. So almost as effective as wind machines, especially if we put a little copper on. Now we can't put copper on around the sheep because it's quite toxic to the sheep, but once they're out, we can go ahead and put some copper down if we don't have any other options. Uh, by putting copper and, and uh, having very close vegetation uh, control in, in the vineyard like this, you really reduce the likelihood that things are gonna freeze. Um, I have sprinklers, so I don't really have to worry about that. I don't use copper in my vineyard, but I've done research in other places, and it is a, uh, an alternative if you don't have any other means of frost protection. Certainly much easier than putting in sprinkler systems or 
wind machines. Under the vine weed control, okay, so it's all mowed down and ready to go. So when you run your clemens through there or your other uh, technique that you have for controlling weeds underneath the vines, it's all pre-cleaned and ready to go. And uh, the results are, are quite good. So again, going back to the thing that we really haven't measured that we need to take a look at is kilocalories in versus kilocalories out. Or in other words, how much diesel fuel are you spending to farm your vineyard? Uh, this is a good way. And what we're finding too with herbicides is, boy, whatever we use, we end up getting resistance. So I, I'm really convinced that long run, coming up with techniques for either cultivation or even better yet, uh, mowing underneath the vines would be a really good way to go, kind of eliminate the worries that we have for uh, uh, resistance to herbicides. You know, impact on the soil. So the, probably the worst publicity that sheep have going for them is that one of the common construction tools called a sheep foot uh, compactor, which is a roller that packs down soil. And uh, what I see here is that, okay, we got some compaction going on, but we also have a lot of what I call uh, uh, macro ponding, which these little sheep footprints uh, will form uh, a nice cash bin for water when it rains and then it perks in if the soil is in good condition. And I, I don't see any long-term damage because the, the compaction here is very superficial. Here's a nice shot of what it looked like. This is down at Fetzer Vineyards, um, about five miles down the road from me. And that's where my sheep ultimately were headed. Rather than uh, bring them in the trailer, they walked them down Old River Road here on uh, the Ukiah Valley. And they ended up at Fetzer, and, and here it is all grazed. This is an organic vineyard. It's, it's pre-bud break. It's a young vineyard, all set to go. It'll be pretty easy to control the, uh, the vineyard floor at this, either through mowing or through uh, uh, under the vine cultivation, whatever you need to do. So, so here it is in summertime. Uh, this is still being grazed. Uh, there's, there was star thistle in this vineyard. This is over in Lake County in Clay Shannon's vineyard. And this is where Robbie and Jamie really kind of sharpened up, sharpened up their skills and really learned how to do a lot of things with sheep and vineyards. And you can see in the middle of summer, it's just clean as a whistle and there are no herbicides, no mowing, no cultivation, just everything grazed by sheep. Here's another shot. And if you look over here on this side, this is where it was grazed with electric fences, and this is where it was not. So what happened here? Well, there's a bunch of uh, star thistle, which is what's growing over here, and star thistle is really a bane. If you graze it early in the season with sheep, you can eliminate it. And plus, you've also created a, a nice, relatively fuel-free zone if you're concerned about fire, which we are because we've had a lot of really nasty ones in the last few years. So having sheep kind of graze the perimeters is another good way for you to uh, to manage the, the landscape uh, and vegetation around your vineyard. So this is how you recycle the weeds and forage. They end up as manure, and, and you already had a little bit of discussion from Emily on this, so I'm not gonna go into great detail on it, but that's how it ends up, so you convert it to that. Um, so one of the things that we did, this was one of the earliest studies I've seen in California on sheep grazing, and this was done under a Western SARE grant. Uh, and I uh, was a co-investigator also with the Chaos Sheep Outfit. And we tried to do a large scale uh, grazing project uh, where we covered about 12 acres, uh, replicated into different cells and uh, compared grazing and not grazing. Uh, in a in a bit organic vineyard, or actually it was a biodynamic vineyard at at Bonterra Vineyards in uh, outside of Ukiah. So we used a randomized complete block uh, analysis of variant statistical design, and we really had two treatments, grazed and ungrazed. There are four replicated blocks of approximately 2.5 acres each, so it's pretty good size, pretty good scale. So the data that we took was forage yields pre and post grazing soil bulk density pre and post grazing, soil fertility pre and post grazing, vine yields and pruning weights, and fruit chemistry. So here's the chaos sheep outfit sheep, and they were arrived and penned. And there's Jamie and her uh, herder moving the sheep into the plots. And this is our youngest helper, this is June, and, and she was, was in there uh, 
you know, I, I, Rob and Jamie are teaching her early to earn her keep and get used to sheep because that's probably what her life's going to be about. Here we are with grazing, so you can see the before and after shots. So this was a little bit of a drier year. We didn't have really huge amounts of forage in there, but it was a pea uh, vetch, or I'm sorry, pea and, and uh, bell bean probably and, and oat mix. And you can see again, so there's a lot of forage that's removed in a relatively short time. We were stocking at the rate of about 40 animals per acre and we grazed for about three days. So what we found is that uh, there's a lot of feed that's removed. Uh, so in the ungrazed areas, there's about 1,400 pounds per acre. And when the sheep were finished, there was about a little bit under 700. So again, as far as cover crop stands go, this was kind of light. So we typically in Mendocino County would expect to have about three to 4,000 pounds of forage. But in this year, it was a dry year, and we just didn't get that much growth. So uh, you can see here's pre-grazing and post-grazing, there were significant differences, but uh, you know, with the no-sheep, we had almost uh, 1,500 pounds of, of dry matter feed. So bulk density, boy, that was a lot of work to do that because we sampled uh, in each plot about 10 different uh, sites. And what, what we found is that the bulk density really didn't change, which didn't surprise me because the conditions were such, it was dryish, so that while there was moisture in the soil, it wasn't really the optimum conditions for compacting the soil. So the sheep had very, very little impact on soil compaction. We also checked soil porosity and found a little bit of reduction, but not significant because I mean, come on, you know, uh, 45.6 to 44.9% our uh, margin of error probably is greater than uh, the differences there. So we found no significant difference in soil porosity. So we weren't compacting soil and we weren't changing the, the porosity. And, and even though we didn't measure it, I'm sure we didn't change the rate of infiltration into that soil. So our conclusions were that the sheep are efficient at harvesting cover crops. Bulk density and porosity were not significantly changed and no real changes in soil fertility, a uh, very short time period for grazing. And really, uh, additional seasons data should be collected as this was a drought year, so it was only a one shot. So I'm really glad to see Emily kind of picking up the, the thread of, from a study like this and really going into great detail over several years, because that's what you need to really be able to talk intelligently about whether or not you're really affecting uh, changes in, in the vineyard uh, growing conditions. Leaf pulling by sheep. Well, this is something that uh, is also uh, being done. It, it's, it's cheaper than using people. It's more expensive than using a machine, but there is a good example of what sheep can do. And uh, you know, they're, they're pretty effective at pulling leaves. And if you, uh, you know, wanna use them for that, it's a real possibility. So they're gonna stay on the shady side of the vines. So they pick on the, you can get them to work on the right side. And there you see they, they're wearing, wearing those wool coats. So it gets warm and uh, they wanna stay in the shade. So you can uh, use them to, to do, uh, you know, pretty precise picking if that's what you want. You do have to work with them. You have to keep them moving. And that's one of the things that that is part of the, the guild. Normally the crew consists of 50 to 60 sheep, a shepherd and a dog. And you have to watch them to make sure they don't overdo it. Because otherwise they're gonna start getting kind of aggressive uh, and pulling off too much uh, foliage. And in our sunny Mendocino climate in the interior, this is a little too much. We really wouldn't want to expose fruit as much as this. You know, the, the vines can handle it a little bit in the beginning of the year, but you're, we would be worried about getting sunburn and, and uh, reduction in, in quality to the fruit if we uh, aggressively pull leaves like this. And this is way too much. I mean, now you've got air blowing through there and, and uh, uh, you know, the, I, I don't like to see leaf pulling done like this. I really prefer to see the afternoon side to be uh, somewhat shaded by leaves. However, when I showed this picture up in Oregon in Willamette Valley, everybody said, whoa, that's what we want. Uh, you know, it's it's pretty expensive to get this kind of leaf pulling by hand. It, it's three or four hundred dollars an acre. So if you could do it for sheep for about 150 an acre, they think that's really a deal. And uh, the sheep really like 
uh, the foliage of grapevines and they evidently they gain weight on it and uh, it's a pretty good thing as far as they're concerned. There are other grazing animals uh, that have been used for different reasons. Um, so we have seen uh, uh, chickens are, are pretty good for, you know, for scratching around underneath the uh, vines. Uh, and I've seen chickens used also for the kind of uh, uh, insectary areas, uh, hedgerows where they'll scratch and, and, uh, and eat some of the, the weeds and certainly they're after insects. Um, they they really love earwigs, and if you know ear earwigs are a problem, chickens can help you. All you have to do is put down some cardboard, and then and the you you walk by in the morning with the chickens and lift up the cardboard, and they they see earwigs, and those are like potato chips for them. And they just go right for them, uh, and they'll eat cutworms. They can be a significant contributor controlling them. Uh, then, then we have geese, and geese tend to be really grass specialists. So if you have an area where there's a lot of grass, the geese are, are really happy to be in there. Uh, here we have rabbits in a movable hutch, and this is really getting kind of extreme. You move the hutch around and, and the rabbits will eat the, the grass and forage, and there are people who, who use their rabbits this way. And then in New Zealand, they're even using kuna kuna pigs. And these are, are cute little guys. They don't get to be very large. They're sort of socialized to people because they were uh, sort of naturalized by the Maori people. And uh, they don't root as much, so they don't rip up your vineyard. And they, they will, pigs will do okay on, on uh, clover and other kinds of forages. So that's something that, uh, that they can be used for. Well, that's kind of all I really have for you today. I'm happy to answer some questions. And, and again, I'm pretty positive with it as somebody who's used it now for about five different uh, seasons. I really can't find any disadvantages with using sheep for grazing. The only bad part is they can be a little rough on, on your drip system. So I think it's a good idea to bring the drip system up higher. And, and we're starting to do that more and more in Mendocino County vineyards because if we're we're hand harvesting. It's nice to have the, the drip hoses up high because then the pickers can uh, move their uh, picking totes back and forth uh, underneath the, the vines easily. And if you're cultivating underneath the vines, if you're in an organic uh, program or you're mowing underneath, uh, it's, it's a lot better to have the hoses up higher. So that's kind of the direction that we're going with that. Uh, so uh, that, that's kind of pretty much it. I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you so much, Glenn. We really appreciate that. Very, very interesting. Uh, we do have a couple questions. Uh, somebody is asking for uh, clarification on how grazing reduces frost damage. Okay, so how you're doing it is that there's real high correlation between having a lot of vegetation on your vineyard floor and the likelihood that you're going to freeze. And there's two reasons why. Uh, one of them is just a simple transfer of heat. We, we know from years ago that these uh, there could be as much as 10 degrees difference in a, in a vineyard floor based on what's growing on it. And uh, when you have a really high amount of vegetation and uh, not much sunlight hits the soil and it doesn't re-radiate at night. And uh, we thought it was originally just simple physics, but uh, under research that I've done with Steve Lindau from UC Berkeley, there's also uh, ice nucleating bacteria. And these are little bacteria that, that uh, help catalysts catalyze the formation of frost. And they're ubiquitous, they're all over the place, but the more vegetation you have around your vines, the more trouble you're gonna have with frost. Uh, when, you're, when your vines first come out, they're fairly sterile, and these ice nucleators migrate from surrounding vegetation, particularly cover crops on the floor. So we know that uh, a real good frost mitigation, if you have no other choice, is basically remove the vegetation from the vineyard floor, either by disking and then packing the ground or by spraying Roundup all over everything. So most people don't want to spray Roundup. So again, uh, mowing really short is a good way to do it. And obviously the sheep are very effective at doing this. So I usually graze just ahead of frost season, uh, just before bud break. And I find this to be a really effective way of reducing ice nucleating bacteria in the vineyard. And then if we add a little copper uh, spray, if we spray, sheep have to be out because copper is toxic to sheep. But if we spray the emerging shoots with copper, we can uh, 
get the vines super cool to go down as low as uh, 28 degrees Fahrenheit with no damage. So uh, it's a very effective frost control technique. Got to work at it, but if you have nothing else, you don't have a wind machine and you don't have sprinklers, it's a good way to go. Thank you. Um, Dr. Larson is going to talk about more about the management of sheep and their health and physiology, but somebody's asking if you know if burr clover is a problem. If the sheep burr clover? Burr clover, yeah. Uh, burr clover is a really delicious feed for sheep. Um, it, it's a little bit of a problem if it goes to seed and they're in a pasture because it tends to get into the wool and then carting it out can be kind of hard. But um, uh, burr clover is, is a medic and uh, it's very nutritious for sheep. It's related to alfalfa. You know, our biggest concern now that is a little bit uncertain to us is uh, what kind of a role that some of the legumes may play in, uh, as intermediate hosts for uh, red blotch. And there's research going on, and I'm, I hope it doesn't turn out to be a big problem, but there's some indication that some of the clovers can be inter intermediaries for red blotch and, and burr clover is one of them. Uh, so there's work going on now by the entomologist to figure out, do we have to worry about having these legumes in the mix? And I hope not, because that would really be a problem for us. But again, if we did have uh, issues with that, the, the vector uh, being the uh, three-cornered alfalfa tree hopper, uh, getting everything as low as possible so there is very little vegetation in the vineyard would be a good idea. And of course, sheep are quite good at doing that. Good, thank you. Uh, I think you addressed this, but just in case I missed it, uh, you were showing grazing during the summer, right? Yes. Okay, so the, the sheep do eat the leaves during the- Yes, they do. So somebody else is asking, uh, is there any, are, are they gonna go for the fruit as well? Do you have to factor in any losses? Well, they don't like the fruit at that point uh, because it's very tart and very tannic. So they don't eat green fruit. Now, if you waited later in the year, they would eat the fruit. So as the fruit ripens, the sheep would be very happy to clean it up. And there's another thing, you know, if you, you don't harvest your crop because you didn't sell it or something, and you were thinking about how could I, you know, get rid of the fruit, I don't really want to leave it out there. Well, first of all, I just tell you, it's, it doesn't harm the, the vines to leave it out there. Uh, it looks awful and you'll feel sad every time you drive by your vineyard and realize you didn't harvest your crop. But if you want to get rid of it, the sheep would eat it. And uh, you might ask Jamie and Rob about that, but that would be another way of cleaning up the, uh, the vineyard and uh, also providing some good feed for the sheep. Going along with that same uh, thought, do you have any recommendations on the max or the optimal vine height for using the sheep for leaf pulling? Does it work in non-trellis vineyards? I don't know because I've never seen it. Um, I have a feeling they would overeat stuff. Like if we, we had some of our head prune vines and stuff, I don't think it'd be very effective because they essentially, uh, when the trellis wire is set like we normally do between 32 and 36 inches, this right in mouth range for kind of our standard size sheep. Uh, and then what um, Sarah, uh, Bennett Kahn did was that when she set the vineyard up, she had the fruiting wire at about 48 inches, and that's pretty much out of their reach. So uh, that's that's partially how you have to set the vineyard up in order to graze it properly. So they, there will be a little bit of a dance I'm seeing because you want to bring the sheep to graze down, but you don't want them there when you have bud break because then they will chew on the on the buds. But you also potentially want to use them for suckering, right? So you can if you want. Mm -hmm. So ideally, you can put them in when your grapes are not ripened, so they will do the leafing, but won't bother mm -hmm. the grapes. You do not want to have them when bud break is happening, but you do want to bring them back to do some suckering, correct? You can, yeah. So on I, I think. Go ahead, sorry. The, the whole thing here is control. And that's one thing we, that we've learned long, long ago. I mean, if you look at the sheep industry in Mendocino County 100 years ago, they would turn them out in the fall and round up the survivors in the spring. That was kind of the approach. And that worked as long as you killed all the predators. And once we stopped doing that, then you had to protect them and manage them and uh, provide more control over how you grazed. And that's pretty much the case here is that you just don't turn them loose in the vineyard necessarily you have them very intensively manage and graze 
and uh, that that's what what makes it work. So control is the whole thing, and and you can do very precise grazing, and I think that Jamie and and uh, Rob will tell you more about that. Uh, and that's part of the management. And of course, the more precise you get, the more expensive it gets, because then you have to have shepherds and dogs and everything in there. So you can do a lot of different things with them. They're very willing to eat most anything, but it it all depends on timing and control. Great, and I, and I think it's important to point out that you have different options. You don't have to own the sheep. If you own your own flock of sheep, then you have to, <clears throat> excuse me, address other concerns. And Dr. Larson is gonna talk about if you own your sheep, what kind of things you have to consider. But then there's companies like Chaos, which uh, would be uh, Robert from Chaos will be our next speaker. Uh, I'm still not done with questions, but I want to point out that they will be able to talk to you about what is it to just hire somebody to bring him. And then you have two alternatives. Either you design your vineyard to have sheep whenever necessary without any potential damage, or you have to make accommodations, but you have to be mindful of the different stages in your vineyard, different growth stages, so that you get the most benefit. That's, that's what I'm hearing from everybody so far. Uh, go, yeah, ahead. go ahead. Yeah, something. That's absolutely right, and and I the the model of letting somebody else be the specialist on grazing and bringing the animals in is I think the best one to go because it's complicated enough to grow grapes, and then if you make wine, that's even more complicated, and then to try to keep your sheep alive from season to season like uh, Sarah and and Ted do at Navarro and Penny Royal is just amazing, and I I'm in awe of them that they they can. Uh, keep this whole thing going. It's just, it's a huge amount of work and a uh, really different kind of specialized knowledge. So I, I don't, I, I don't want to have people come away from this talk today thinking that they need to go out and get themselves a flock of sheep. I mean, that, that would be probably the wrong message. Although I think it's great if you can find someone like Rob and Jamie to work with uh, so that, that you can do some controlled grazing in the vineyard. We'll, we'll hear from our growers next Friday. I know that Sinsky, Robert Sinsky Vineyards, they do have a very small flock that they have uh, and they graze, but it's not enough. So they do hire somebody to bring sheep to them as well. So it's, it would be another whole business to have your own flock, but some people might be interested in learning. So that's what we're going to have Dr. Larson. Uh, Glenn, another question here. People are concerned about the voles. Uh, do you have any insight on how it affects or benefits as far as your vole problem and having rodents in the vineyard when you're grazing? Uh, I'm sorry, did you say voles? Yeah. So somebody said that they have some issues with voles girdling vines. Oh, well, this will take right. care of it because essentially they, they remove all the habitat for the voles. And it, it becomes a question of, how long do you leave the sheep in? Because you can do a, a light grazing or a heavy grazing, and the more uh, time you have in there, the more they're gonna remove. And, and I find that to be amazingly efficient. And this year, we actually pruned ahead of, the, of bringing the sheep in, because we didn't get our timing quite right, but the sheep kind of pushed the brush aside and, and ate everything down. So when they're in there and they're stocked heavy, uh, they're, they're gonna move pretty quickly to try to eat everything that's possible. They're really concerned about having enough food. So uh, they'll graze everything up and, uh, and kind of even knock down some of the last year's uh, uh, dry matter that was left behind. And uh, you know, you'll end up with a pretty clean vineyard floor without very much on it. So that would be a, a good sort of integrated pest management approach to getting the voles under control. The other thing that happens, of course, you know, where I live is just amazing. So I'm right along the Russian river and we have a pretty good sized riparian forest and there, there are so many uh, birds of prey out there, so many different kinds of hawks. And uh, they, they are after uh, you know, rodents pretty much all the time. And we also have a lot of bobcats and uh, little foxes. So there's, there's plenty of creatures to, to go after, um, you know, to, to let the sort of natural uh, cycle of, of predation and prey happen. So uh, the sheep kind of make it very wide and open for uh, predators to get after rodents. And if all else fails, the Russian River floods about every two years and it's pretty tough being a gopher in my vineyard because uh, between the predators and the flooding, it's not likely you're going to survive very much. 
Definitely, and that, that applies to, even if you're not grazing with sheep uh, or just keeping your undervine growth down, uh, it would help you keep your rodents uh, under control. So whether it's with sheep, whether you're doing mechanical weeding, whether you're doing herbicide spray, you wanna keep that down, but also, uh, as we know, there's drawbacks to using herbicide, so you'll, you'll have some extra benefits that Glenn and Emily and Kelsey already mentioned from having the sheep. Not the only alternative, but if you do have the sheep, it'll help you. Uh, we yeah, still so have, go ahead. I, I, uh, the, the more I look at this, the more I think that, that uh, an approach like this of, of mowing underneath the vines and using sort of annual cover crops is a, a very good way to to manage a vineyard floor. If it was up to me, I would go with self-reseeding annuals. Um, I would have a really good under the vine mowing machine and they're getting better. And uh, I, I would probably move away from disking and move away from herbicides. I'm not anti-herbicide, but what I see happening is that when we get a good herbicide, we tend to use it. And the next thing you know, there's something resistant to it. So uh, we went to a Roundup only program probably from about 2000 to 2010, a lot of people were looking at as, as being kind of an environmentally friendly way to farm. And we now have the most amazing resistant weeds to Roundup that you've ever seen. And a Roundup only program does nothing anymore. So that's why having other options for under the vine weed control is really a, a good idea. Yeah, I'm definitely with you on that, Glenn. Uh, I'm a big proponent of having multiple tools in your toolbox. When you overuse one of those tools, then that's when we encounter issues. And that's what we're seeing with Roundup. Roundup is cheap, it works, but we are seeing a lot of resistance because we have been overusing it. So just uh, having the sheep consideration will be just another tool in your toolbox. Um, we uh, run out of questions, but somebody is uh, curious about that yellow flower that you had on your background. Uh, somebody would like to know the name. Uh, th that is an ornamental mullen. Uh, so we have native mullens, uh, but that's one that is an ornamental, I think, from the Mediterranean, and it's really pretty. Uh, it has big uh, fuzzy gray leaves, and then it puts up a big spike uh, in the summertime and, and is a, a really good insectary plant because it, it gets visited by a lot of different predators and parasitoids. Awesome. Well, that's all the questions. So this is a perfect timing for a little break. So we're gonna go ahead uh, and take 10 minutes for anybody that needs to use the restroom or stretch out, get refill a coffee. So we're gonna come back at 9.50. Uh, please make sure that you come back and join us because we're gonna start sharp at 9.50 and the next speaker would be Robert Irwin from Kales Grazing and he's gonna talk about his operation and how he has been contributing to this uh, study at our vineyard in Wichita Creek. So please uh, stay tuned in 10 more minutes. Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming back. Uh, we're ready to go. So we have uh, Robert and Jamie who are the owners and operators along with their family of Kales Grazing and they've been kind enough to join us today. They uh, are the company that we are partnering out uh, to bring the sheep to our um, vineyard in Carneros and they've actually been doing some work in Napa. So please uh, help me welcome them. They're gonna have a short presentation and then we're gonna open up for questions. So feel free to start uh, writing down your question on the chat group and I'll keep track of them. All right, Robert, it's all yours. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I was like, yeah, they, unmute, they muted me again. All right, uh, my, I'm Robert Irwin, uh, co-owner of Chaos Sheep Outfit. I own, uh, my wife and I started the company back in 2010. Uh, we uh, have a grazing company, contract grazing company that uh, works in uh, Lake Mendocino, uh, Sonoma, Napa, Yolo, Calusa, Sutter counties. If I'm forgetting one, I apologize. Uh, we have a fairly large operation. Uh, we work with uh, about 120 different landowners. Um, maybe more we keep trying to figure out that number but it's a large number um 
we work on it with uh, vineyards as small as uh, four acres to as large as uh, 4,000 to 6,000 acres. Uh, we also do uh, uh, work in pear orchards, walnut orchards. Uh, we started doing cover crop grazing for tomatoes, sunflowers, uh, uh, far, you know, row crop farming down in Sutter County. Um, we do fire break grazing for homeowners associations. Uh, so uh, we, we do technical, uh, and then we do leaf picking uh, as well. Uh, we've worked, uh, you know, we work with a lot of a lot of different vineyards with a lot of different goals. Uh, not two vineyards are the same. Um, everybody's got a different philosophy, and uh, it's been a, a fun, a fun and a challenging thing to kind of take on. Uh, we run about three thousand to four thousand breeding ewes, uh, which would give gives us between three to five thousand lambs every year. And then we run another uh, three to four thousand feeder lambs uh, during the from September to May, uh, which is part of that is during the vineyard season, um, which helps us boost our numbers for our what we call our wet season. Uh, we mob graze uh, vineyards at about uh, five hundred sheep. Uh, we're we're kind of toning that down to about 450 for a 10 to a 20 acre block uh, for four to five days. We're currently uh, working with Fiber Shed on cost analysis that we're gonna uh, share with, with everybody once we kind of figure it out. We're building a, a, a kind of a system right now so that if uh, other contract grazers uh, can then bid jobs, know kind of what the cost uh, analysis is on a sheep front um, because we're trying to find our break even, uh, which is really hard to do with uh, the multiple level um, grazing that we do with multiple different uh, types of sheep uh, with ewes, ewes and lambs, and then feeder lambs, trying to figure out where the margins are with those so that this grazing thing if the research is good and everybody says it's right, we can kind of multiply and have and spread it across the entire state. You got anything to add, honey? No. I don't know if okay. Jamie wants to talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, no, that's good. Keep going, Rob. Okay. okay. Uh, is there any questions out there? Are there some of the questions that were up from before that you, you think we need to cover or do you want me to keep going on a monologue? Uh, you can keep going. I don't have any questions yet. Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll give uh, everybody uh, kind of our sheep season and we'll, we'll start from there. I'm guessing that the questions pop up from there. Uh, our sheep season uh, starts in August. Um, Kind of September 1st is when what we call the beginning of our year uh, from September our year our fiscal year for our sheep starts on se uh, September 1st and then it'll come around to the 30th of August. Uh, September 1st will be in alfalfa uh, alfalfa and summer cover crop fields um, getting ready to lamb. Uh, we'll be f mostly uh, coming off of a mountain uh, you know where we we're managing a star thistle and fire break stuff. It will be completely done by then. We'll be getting the sheep prepared for lambing. For lambing, we uh, mainly go on alfalfa residue. So we eat alfalfa residue down in uh, Calusa and uh, Yolo uh, counties. And uh, from there, as the lambs uh, get, we start lambing about the 15th of October and uh, we'll get everything kind of organized and then we'll move into uh, pear orchards around the 1st of November and we move into vineyards about the 1st of this, uh, January. So the 1st of January every year is kind of when we start to cycle. We really don't like to make uh, to go in later uh, because what happens is is we won't be able to make that second pass before bud break and if we let the cover crop take off and put you know um, Glenn McGordy was kind of talking about it earlier about we figure it's about on a, on a normal rainfall year we've got somewhere between three and five thousand pounds of dry matter to consume uh, if you've got it you know on April 1 
uh, and if we get to that point, my, sh I, uh, my sheep can't eat it all that. I mean, the amount of sheep you would need to eat that amount of forage is, you know, exponential, you know, a million sheep. So what we try to do is we try to take off some of the tonnage in January, come back in and take off some of the tonnage uh, again, right at bud break. And then what we do is we start in the white grapes because that's what's going to be the bud, the bud break coming around the second time. So we will start in kind of the same sequence as bud break. Uh, so we've had some challenges with, with flood and a few other things that have made all that stuff a lot, really hard to keep it in a perfect, uh, perfect rhythm. But um, from there, we'll, we'll go through one whole system. Uh, we'll go through the whole vineyard one time, starting about January 1st. Then we'll come back around. If we're going too fast, we'll do non-crop areas. If we're, uh, if we're going too slow, then we just bypass all that stuff. And uh, uh, if, I, if I got to bypass uh, all the non-crop areas, we usually pick those up after bud break. One of the things we do for most of our vineyards is we throw in a lot of the dam faces in, in any of the outlying areas around uh, is part of our per acre charge. Uh, we charge at the bare minimum uh, $50 an acre for our very large non-trucking vineyards. So where we can walk, um, uh, where we can walk one group of sheep to the next vineyard. Uh, anytime you add trucking or uh, freight in, it really, uh, it raises our cost exponentially. It uh, doesn't cost us much money to walk the sheep. It costs us about a thousand dollars truckload at the bare minimum just to move them even a mile down the road because you've got to deadhead the truck from wherever it is to that spot. Load the sheep, unload the sheep, build a corral, have three to four people there to load the sheep, unload the sheep. It, it, it gets pretty expensive in the trucking end. We, uh, if we're walking sheep, you, you're out, uh, you're out uh, diesel, you're out, you know, you're not burning tires up. You're just walking sheep down the road. Still takes the three to four people, but there's no corral. And in all honesty, um, a walking sheep about three miles takes about an hour. To move sheep about three miles on a semi takes about four. So um, everything's just a lot easier on, on the animals, the stress level on the herders, the people. Um, so that we really try to talk people into putting put walking sheep in Napa and Sonoma County. It can be very difficult to do that. Uh, but what we've gotten to do some really good um, relationships, especially at the RCD plot, where we've asked a few neighbors and we've got enough vineyards close by to where we can walk through somebody's property to another vineyard. And that's kept our costs low at the RCD facility, even though they're kind of in an island out by themselves they're within a half a mile or three quarters of a mile of another vineyard that we're already grazing. Uh, Glenn uh, had talked about Shannon ranches and Shannon vineyards. Uh, we work pretty closely with them trading sheep back and forth. Uh, I graze some of their vineyards and then, uh, then they borrow some sheep from me later in the year to do leaf picking. Uh, Glenn's right, we did, uh, that's the leaf picking uh, we really honed in on with, with, with clay. Uh, he saves quite a bit of money every year with leaf picking. They also do some suckering at the same time if you let the suckers stay, um, and then you get the get the suckering at the end. Um, and then from the end of the vineyard at bud break, we'll kind of scatter out, do a lot of stuff. But we we are going to put into our contracts coming up that we won't stay in an area for more than two weeks after bud break until uh, fruit set. We, we won't have the sheep anywhere near the vineyards uh, unless uh, there's just a little, there's too much risk at that point, unless the block, unless there's, you know, fencing, um, a bunch of other stuff going on because those buds, when they're about an inch or two inches tall are really tasty and the sheep really love them. And unless you can get that up in the air to where the sheep won't eat them with, with vineyard management, uh, you're, uh, there's certain things you can or can't do there. So, um, Going forward, we're going to try to do some risk management uh, on our end and just pull out completely unless the vineyards are built for it. Uh, from there, when we leave the vineyards, we go down. Uh, we go down to cover crop grazing. Uh, we wean our lambs at that point, and we go into uh, grazing tomato where we're going to plant tomatoes, corn, uh, cotton, hemp, um, row crop farming. We'll 
put the lambs on there to fat, finish fattening the lambs. Uh, feeder lambs are going to be doing the same thing. Uh, that's between March 1st and April 15th, depending on the year. This year was March 1st. Um, we've left Mendocino County as early as like, I think February 18th at bud break. Those years are really difficult for us because it's, uh, you're, you kind of figure your scheduling and um, it seems like mother nature can throw that calendar really far forward or really far back. Um, and then, so when we get done with that cover crop grazing, lambs usually get harvested. What doesn't make it uh, fat or a, you know a prime lamb at that point will then get fed a little bit of alfalfa uh, pellets finished off and make it to the harvest facility. Uh, sometimes we put a little bit of corn in with the pellet, but in a kind of a free range situation. Um, and then the ewes will uh, go get on a dry hillside, dr uh, dry their bags up so that they don't get mastitis. Um, then we'll go from there into fire grazing into the homeowners uh, associations, municipalities, um, power companies, uh, private private landowners that are interested in, uh, in getting uh, fire break done around their houses that usually starts in about May 1st uh, from and that'll go all the way through the end of July 1st of August and then at the kind of the same point we start working on star thistle control and targeted grazing for specific grass species or um, weeds and that'll kind of take us into September and that there's a lot of overlap in there I'm giving you a rough guesstimate you know guesstimation times uh, and then, you know, we'll start, a, or, you know, walnuts will be in there as well. And they kind of, they're swinging in between that May time into June. Uh, pears can start in September sometimes, uh, depending on the year. Um, so it's all, and again, it's, uh, I'm not in control of the climate. I don't know if anybody is, and that swings heavily one way to the other. And we just kind of the reason we're called chaos sheep outfit is the world is chaotic and we try to just do our best we can to manage the the, the swings and in, in the um and in, in, in what's going on right now it seems like the last 10 years has it's been um, um uh, between fires floods um droughts it's been a pretty chaotic 10 years to be a livestock business uh, in california uh, Going forward, challenges uh, are going to be a lot different, I believe. Uh, the social dist uh, distancing um, is making it really hard for our smaller uh, wineries and vineyards to sell wine uh, and get tourism, you know, people to come to their tasting rooms. So um, we'll see that uh, we're not scared. We're excited about the future. Uh, we're excited to keep adapting to what goes on uh, going forward. We got any questions, Miguel? Yes, we have a few questions now. Um, the first question asks if the sheep go in a sheep gut quarantine period to clear their digestive tract of wheat seeds. One more time, I didn't hear that. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you, but you're okay. breaking up. Just a sec. What was yes, that? Uh, people are asking if the sheep go in a sheep gut quarantine period to clear their digestive tract of wheat seeds. Okay, uh, we don't, uh, we can, sometimes we do. Uh, sometimes we shear sheep, if we've got a, uh, like, it um, was a good point Glenn brought up, is the medic can get stuck in the wool, also uh, cockle burrs and lots of seeds, different weed seeds can get caught up in the wool. And we have sheared in, uh, in the middle of summer to knock that, uh, those seeds off, uh, barbed goat grass is one of those. Uh, we try to keep the spread of those things down. Really, the only uh, seed that can go through the sheep's digest digestive tract is um, legumes, uh, clover, vetch, anything with a hard seed. Uh, grain, uh, for the most part, any kind of grain or grass, you know, rye grass has got a grain, right? So any kind of grass species uh, gets digested, broke down, and can't really live through the rumen because the rumen's got four quadrants. Uh, you've got to have that hard seed kind of a legume mustard would probably be able to make it through the digestive tract. Um, there's, you know, you're, that, that anything with a hard seed uh, will make it through, but it, uh, they're not quite like cattle. The rumen in cattle, it, it, it passes faster. Sheep uh, passes a lot slower and they grind things up a little bit more. And we've 
clover, we've had about a 30% pass through on clover seed. And I've never really seen a problem uh, with, with uh, the grass species through the sheep. I've never seen that get moved around. Mostly would be from wool or from our ATVs. Thank you. Uh, next question, do you use formal written contracts? Do you handle risk prevention and mitigation for both the vineyard, vine or irrigation damage and the sheep health and safety? So we, uh, we haven't in the past and we are in the future. Um, mainly you do everything after you learn a hard lesson and we've had, a, uh, we learned a, a very hard lesson about a year ago and we're going to have written contracts going forward, uh, mostly with new clients. Um, and we might have to do that with old clients, but that's one of the things we, we work really closely with fiber shed. And um, I never thought that, uh, that we were gonna get, we had 50 sheep. I mean, I, well, I'll be honest, we started with 50 sheep in 2010 and there's no way I, uh, Jamie or I, uh, or anybody that knows us could have forecasted what was gonna happen. Um, and we're not, you know, um, it's, it's a new world to us. So uh, having contracts and not just being able to shake hands is, is different for us. Um, you know, we've, we've had con you know, relationships with people for over 10 years, business relationships. And uh, we just talk about what we're doing and everybody's kind of held up their end of the bargain. Um, I don't think that that's, uh, I think we've got to change. Uh, it's not just for the risk of the, uh, it's for the risk of both sides. That way there's a clear, uh, you know, as, bu as busy as we are now, I think sometimes uh, maybe I'll forget to say something which is not good for everybody. So uh, getting a clear kind of list of what the expectations are from the cons customer or the vineyard and what our expectations are is uh, from, from the, the grazer side. So water, we need access to water. Um, we need, there's a lot of things we're gonna need from our, our, our the land base. So talking about all those things, uh, getting all that up, I think needs to be written out. We've kind of learned our lesson on that idea. And um, you know, going forward, there will be in the past, we haven't, but that was just, I think, you know, the development of a company and an idea and a grazing system all at the same time, the one thing that was the slowest to catch up was the legality of it. All right, uh, next question. Uh, somebody's asking if the cost per acre for the whole season, January to April? So depending on the vineyard, depending on the size, the, the acreage of the vineyard, the location and how much freight we're going to have into it, we, we won't, we, our, our break even is, is it like $48 uh, on those large, large vineyards. So we're, uh, we're learning that more and more coming up. So it's at fit, we, we won't graze a vineyard unless for uh, less than 50. Uh, we've grazed some mountain vineyards that are really hard access points. A lot of miles in, a lot of miles out in the Napa uh, Napa Valley, in northern Napa Valley, and those will range from a hundred and a quarter to two hundred dollars an acre, depending on the size of the vineyard. The freight bill, what we do is we put the freight bill over the top of the acreage. So um, sometimes the you know if there's eighty acres up on top of a hill, the freight bill in and out is the same as the twenty five acres. So it 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 all depends on the you'll have to talk to a to a grazer. And, and have them come out and take a look. But, you know, we, we can't do any of these really hard vineyards for less than a hundred and a quarter um, because it, the amount of labor and, and freight going in and out of them get pretty, pretty hard. But uh, even if you've got a 10 acre vineyard, but your neighbors work together, I like to stress this a lot because I believe in community. Uh, and if you're gonna be grazing sheep, maybe your neighbor will be grazing sheep. And if everybody uses the same, um, same grazer uh, work as a as a community instead of being in competition. Um, you know, work work together and it cheap it work. It, it, you know, you're you're not just doing it for cost savings, but it's also environmental savings because that's less trucking, less freighting. That's less you know fossil fuels getting burned up and down the road. Uh, and 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 working as a community, I think, just strengthens the community. You know, all the way around. That is, that is definitely an important point to make. The more neighbors you get together to do this, your cost will go down. So that's one of the things that we're trying to promote with this kind of workshop, show you what we are learning in our 
experimental trials, but I'll also show you that it can be a communal thing because we don't have somebody local that will bring the sheep and for chaos to bring them, it will be costly. So it would be, we would really encourage you to talk to your neighbors and get a group of people together that would like to do this. Uh, next question, Robert, uh, people want to know about your background. What drew you into the industry? If you love it and any challenges and favorite parts? Okay, that's, uh, uh, so I'm a, a, a third generation uh, sheep farmer. Um, my mom grew up in Sonoma County, Healdsburg. Uh, she raised sheep, was in 4-H, and uh, her uh, brother uh, ran 4K, my uncle Bruce, uh, or not 4K, uh, CK Lamb, uh, which was really popular in Sonoma, Marin, and San Francisco for a long period of time. My grandfather was a veterinarian in Healdsburg. Uh, he was the first uh, president, uh, this is going to make, this is making my wife happy, by the way, because she wanted me to talk about the generational knowledge, which I don't think is as important as she does, but that's because she, uh, she's fresh into this. Um, so my grandfather was the first president of the uh, small room, which is now, it's now the small room that uh, veterinary pract uh, practitioners, it used to be just the sheep, but now it includes goat and llamas because the industries have gotten so small. Um, Anyway, he was the first president. The sheep's been in our blood forever. He he had sheep. Uh, he gave his Suffolk sheep to my mother. When my mother passed away, uh, I've got those sheep. I still have them today. There's about 100 of them. Uh, my wife hates those sheep. They get out all the time. Uh, they are no longer allowed in vineyards. We've uh, Fetzer's uh, was mad at us for quite a while with how many times they got out of the fence, uh, which is one of the things we talk about a little bit about breeds of sheep. But anyway, I really love the Suffix. Uh, we use those uh, rams on on all of our uh, all of our white face ewes that we do use for grazing to make a meteor lamb for the market. Um, I am very very passionate about sheep industry. Um, I care a great deal. Uh, we go. We've been to uh, every convention, uh, national convention for the last ten years. We're part of a couple of committees. Um, we uh, we're on the board of the Cloverdale Ram Sale. Um, the reason why I guess I'm very, very passionate about it is my children. Um, I grew up around sheep and outside, uh, creek bottoms playing and herding and doing those things. And I think it's really important. It's a really important thing uh, for me personally to have my daughter kind of do the same thing. Uh, it's a type of life that you can't ask for really. Um, you just, uh, kind of have to make it. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of how we came up to where uh, we're at now is unfortunately land doesn't get paid for by animals anymore. The cost of the land is surpassed, whether cattle or sheep, goats, horses, anything you'd raise on the land. Uh, you couldn't buy a piece of property, work the land with livestock and pay for it. So uh, we had to set off to do it differently, which is where we started in with the vineyard grazing. And then from vineyard grazing, it spawned off uh, vineyard owners owned pear orchards, vineyard owners owned walnut orchards. Then once you start in a walnut, somebody else picks you up in the walnut or a different pear orchard, they do something else. Um, they do row crop farming, maybe some alfalfa. Next thing you know, you're grazing um, a lot of things. Uh, but our system was more or less built on what we I call the modern, uh, a modern, mo uh, uh, modern model which is actually a really ancient model of having a lot of animals and mass movement, uh, grazing fast or, or in short periods and, and not going back for a while. Um, I believe that you should never have sheep on a piece of land and not like a whole property, but one piece of land for more than 30 days a year. We try to do that. Um, my wife uh, is a first generation sheep, uh, sheep herder. Uh, her parents are uh, both in uh, education, science, and communications, and um, that's her background. She has a, a master's degree in science and math education and a bachelor's in natural resources. So the combination between the two of us has, has really, been, uh, really been a positive. Um, a lot of the animal health issues, and I think Stephanie is going to maybe talk about this later, uh, it, you really do have to have a lot of experience. Um, I, w I work really closely with Shannon uh, ranches and their sheep operation. And um, in 
Clay laughs all the time, but you know, he says, I don't know anything about it. You just got to make sure that they're healthy. And so I spend a lot of time with Clay making sure everything he's got going is going in the right direction. Um, there's parasite issues when you do mob grazing and you go too fast or get flooded out and have to move around. There's a lot of really tinkering things that are really important to get to know um, before you before you buy a bunch of sheep uh, or you know you're going to need somebody with a lot of experience. Um, but the animals, I mean, it's just that's what I've ever wanted to do. I've all I've ever wanted to do is raise sheep, and this is how I figured out how to do it. Might not be right, not might not be wrong, but uh, this is what we're doing. I'd, I'd like to touch on the, the generational um, piece because before we move to another question, this is Jamie. Um, but yeah, I've, I'm first generation. I've been working with sheep for about 10 years and I still consider myself, you know, very, very novice. Um, it's, there's, there's so many things with herd health and um, understanding the markets and the lamb market, the wool market, um, all of those things that are, are just it's um it's not something to just go out and buy 500 sheep and and start this without um somebody who's been it i would say at least three to four to five generations um and what's interesting about the sheep industry is that the lamb prices are you know con constantly fluctuating and the wool and um the labor uh, is increasing by i think somebody asked a question about this by um 2025 the the cost for herders is going to almost double or more than double um so that in order for the sheep industry to to survive they're going to need to figure out how to um, integrate target grazing um, paid to graze type things into their um into their year um and and I really would like to see vineyards um, working with sheep producers that you know, are established and know about the, the health of the animals um, because things can go sideways pretty quickly um, unless you really understand the animal. Um, but I, I think that's a unique partnership and relationship, but that also integrated with, um, you know, uh, the universities doing research I think that needs to continue um, and, and be part of those partnerships. Um, so anyways, it's, it's a, it, you're, you're making the system very complex and um, I think it's great, um, but the, the partnerships are important. So back uh, to the question. Going back to the communities, I agree. Your, your, your community stuff, instead of, you know, instead of thinking any like every other contract grazer out there is direct competition to us, we we free flow information as much as we can uh, because a lot of this stuff is new. Um, you know, it was done you know fourteen hundreds, but I don't know any of those people. Um, but also talking, you know, with this mob grazing and high density grazing, the risk for making mistakes goes up. Uh, exponential and the animals are in close contact and in and, and you can make them uh, the, the the backlash can be pretty drastic pretty quickly so um you know fiber shed and Brittany cole bush are working on the grazing school of the west uh they're putting that together uh Piscini's ranch uh, and kelly mulville uh are i think part of that system they're trying to do some training stuff to get people going because I think one of the things for our industry to survive is to bring in new generation. This is where I disagree with Jamie. We've got to start now on moving. We've got to get all that knowledge moved on because very shortly it won't, it, there, the knowledge won't be here. Awesome. That's, that's a great, great story. I never get tired of hearing it because you guys are doing an amazing job and it's not easy. We appreciate the hard work that you guys do. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions in case I run out of time for the questions, folks. I did share both uh, Jamie's and Robert's email addresses. Uh, feel free to contact them if we don't get to your question. And we'll have a little bit of time at the end uh, for a couple more questions. But Robert, uh, if you can still uh, join us, that's great. We understand that you're busy if you need to move on. 
but at the end around 11 o'clock we'll come back and we address some of the question uh, another question that people are asking is about your breeds what kind of breeds do you have and if you see going um, with pear sheep versus the cost of shears and price of wool and going along on the same lines, uh, people are asking if it's feasible for your sheep wool to be used for fiber production. Okay, very good question. Uh, we, uh, we have tried hair sheep. Uh, leaf picking with hair sheep is impossible, so we've moved away from it. It limits, uh, one of the things I try to do in, with our company is limit the amount of limits we have. So I try to leave, I don't, I try to stay out of corners. I try to not, we don't consider ourselves biodynamic, organic, uh, all natural, grass fed, or any of those things. We have products that are antibiotic free and grass and grass fed, but I'm not gonna guarantee that year on year out. Uh, the problem is, is we have massive amount of floods uh, on a year you can't, uh, and then we'll end up having to use antibiotics to keep foot rot at bay. Um, but one of the one of the reasons there is is um, is going into that hair sheep. We if we use hair sheep, we can't do leaf picking. So we've got to stay uh, away from the hair sheep for us. We've kind of settled in on a Cordale Cordale Rambouillet cross. We really like that breed. Uh, Cordale it handled the high rainfall for the most part. Uh, not an 80 inch rainfall, but a, a 48 to 50 inch rainfall. Can also ha uh, handle high temp heat temperatures that we'll get in the valley. that are really kind of all around breed. Uh, we've used a lot of uh, Targi, uh, some Columbia. I try to stay away from Columbia's. Uh, we've used a lot of Rambley, Targi, Cordale is mainly the base of our U flock. We had a little bit of Polypay, but I try to uh, stay away from that as well because I want to keep my wool quality at a certain point. Uh, I, I believe that wool is worth money. I believe uh, that in the future wool is going to come back. Uh, I used to be a sheep shearer, so that's why I have that. Um, but uh, the other on the other end of that... Sorry, my phone's ringing like crazy all of a sudden. Um, I, so... Four in a row. Uh, this year, a wool is going to damn near be unsaleable. Um, and it, uh, it was. Essential or non essential uh, is, is different. Uh, so, uh, in the trade with China, has really, really hurt the wool market. Uh, starting about the middle of last year with the trade wars and now with the uh, COVID-19 has really slammed that market. I'm not going to deviate from our, my, my course. I believe if you put a good solid natural product uh, out there um, that's been cared for and has a story behind it uh, and people uh, going away from fossil fuels and moving towards more local stuff, I just believe that, that, that wool sheep are, uh, are the future. Uh, I and again, it goes back to the it, it is more labor, and with shortage of labor, it will be difficult. But uh, I think wool as a fiber in a cloth is 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 really uh, there's no second to it, it's, it's in the class all by itself. Okay, thank you so much, Robert. We run out of time uh, to address more questions, but I encourage anybody who's answered the and get answered to either email me, you can email Robert or Jamie. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Stephanie Larson. Um, Dr. Larson, do we have you? There you are. Here I am. Hi. Okay. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Larson is the County Director and Livestock Range Management Advisor for the UC Public Extension in Sonoma. And she will be talking to us a little bit more about the ship integration and management. Uh, again, I encourage you to stop, uh, start dropping your questions for Dr. Larson as, uh, as you wish on the group chat. And then we'll have a little bit of time for questions for her at the end, and then a little bit of extra time for general questions. Uh, so Dr. Larson, please take it away. Okay, so are you have my slides or am I running my slides? 
Uh, you should be running them. Um, if you open up your presentation and then go down the screen, there's a share screen button. Oh. And you should be able to share your screen that way. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't hired for my PowerPoint skills. Just saying. We're all uh, learning, don't worry. No, but I've been listening and this has been really great. Um, so a lot of the stuff I'm going to um, share. Can you see it? We got it. Uh, oh, perfect. Okay, great. So um, anyway, like I said, I've been listening and I might be repeating some of this stuff, but that's okay because then it just strengthens that information. And so I want to talk about the integration and management of sheep in vineyards, what okay, I'd like to refer sorry. to. Pardon really me? Quick, uh, do you mind clicking on your presentation just so that you start the presentation so we see all your slides just so that it gets a little bigger? Absolutely. Again, <laughs> I'm going to keep my day job, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, trying to find that there. If you go to your bottom. There we got it. Oh, All right. There you go. Awesome. Again, I better keep my day job. Okay. <laughs> so thanks, everybody. Um, so as I was going to say, I like to refer this to um, vines and ovines, which is obviously what sheep are called is ovines. And so let me dive into this. So we've talked about grazing and the and I really am uh, interested in grazing It's kind of my, my passion is is that, you know, these are forages that we can't consume, but ruminants can, and they can provide a service for us. So grazing is very natural. It happens from um, within wild and domestic animals, um, along with fire. Grazing is the oldest vegetative uh, management tool that we have, and grazing can change plant communities. So obviously, if you're using grazing to do that, you can move from um, an annual to a perennial system, or just reduce unwanted species in general. So when you're thinking about weed control options in vineyard, and I'm not telling you guys anything you don't already know, but you, you know you have the option of, of chemical and mechanical and manual. And I have fire in there in a way that um, obviously we've had fires and it obviously can completely control uh, vegetation in a vineyard, but not in a way we want. So we don't usually think about fire as a tool so what we are concentrating today is more of the, the biological aspects of it. And so we want to think about how do we implement grazing with sheep in particular in our vineyards. So what I always tell folks is that you want to think about um, using grazing um, and what your objectives are. So when you think about it, if you're either you're listening today and you're like going, do I want to own my own sheep? Do I want to put grazing in my vineyards? Do I want to hire somebody to do it? So thinking about my object, your objectives might be to reduce the use of chemicals. Um, so maybe you want to be more organic or that's just part of your um, philosophy. You want to reduce the use of chemicals and Glenn mentioned that. You want to reduce mechanical vegetation control. So maybe you're, you're looking at reducing fuel costs, maybe doing more of a green um, production. So reducing atmospheric carbon emissions perhaps reduce your labor cost. You wanna look at improving soil quality. And we've, that was mentioned today about conversion of plant material into fertilizer and improve soil's ability to sequester carbon. So that could be helpful for you. Um, Glenn talked about improving yield and quantity and quality of the fruit, and then incorporating the organic and sustainable vineyard management practices. You also might wanna look at it as a marketing tool. So it's this idea of, of using all of these objectives and then putting that on your label or in telling your story when you do marketing. So we've, we've talked a lot about today about, um, you know, do you want to own or do you want to lease sheep? And um, Robert was just mentioning about breeds. So let's just think about if you want to own your own sheep. What does that all entail? So you have to think about what breed you might want. So obviously, Bigger breeds can graze or browse higher. Um, some breeds are more hardier, the more disease resistant. So we don't have to worry about that. But what the age is, do you want older sheep? Um, they're gonna eat different plants or do you want both older and younger? So the older sheep can train the younger sheep. 
do you want um, females? Are you going to be involved in reproduction? So are you going to be part of, is that going to be part of your business plan or weathers, which are castrated males? And they're just, their job is just grazing. And so they don't, you don't have to worry anything about, they're not going to worry about production. They're just going to graze. And then the, um, the condition of them. So obviously, if you're gonna own sheep, you want them to be healthy. You want them to provide enough nutrition to keep them healthy and grazing. And so you're not having to worry about um, reproduction issues and um, you know sheep dying on you. So again, a lot of things to think about if you wanna own or lease sheep. So let's say you wanna own your own sheep. So I really think you need to think about that's as a completely different enterprise. And I think Glenn mentioned that as far as you guys are busy growing grapes, making wine. Now you're going to add an additional enterprise. So what we've, um, we've heard about with Sarah Bennett and Navarro Vineyards, that's kind of like the, the next generation coming back and saying, I want to do something different. I want to build on the vineyard operation and now I want to have a sheep operation and I'm going to make cheese. And so it's some way to bring the next generation back to the farm, but it also might be a way to diversify your enterprises. So you have to decide, am I going to raise, in addition to my grazing, am I going to raise meat from this sheep enterprise, wool? Am I going to raise cheese? So then I'm got, therefore I'm going to be milking these sheep. Am I going to do biomedical, which is a collection a lot of times of blood? Um, am I going to do landscape management? Am I going to not only graze my vineyard, I'm going to graze the neighbor's vineyard and the neighbor's vineyard? Or am I going to increase, um, you know, agritourism? Am I going to have meat sales along with my wine sales? So it's that combination of how might I expand my enterprises and add value to this, this operation. So Robert was just talking about it. So choosing a breed helps you, if you're gonna actually go in and do this, then you have to know what you're gonna do with that, that animal, that enterprise. So sheep are raised um, for wool, meat, milk, and grazing. So it's based on the environment, the adaptability, management goals, and personal preference. Jamie mentioned it. He likes Suffolk. So those are the dark-faced sheep. Um, some people like hair sheep. They don't have to, um, to shear those. So really, it's going to depend on your preference, what kind of labor you want to be involved in. So if we can further drill down from a wool standpoint, you've got fine wool. So you could be growing um, merino sheep for sweaters, uh, medium wool, long wool, crossbred wool, hair sheep, and dairy. So lots of choices if you really wanted to go into the sheep business, but realizing that if you have wool, it has to be shorn. You need to get shears in there. If you have hair sheep, they just drop their wool and go. They don't need to have it be shorn. And then dairy sheep, obviously, you're going to milk them just like you, you would a goat or a dairy cow. So those, that's involved in choosing a breed. So knowing what it is, um, what breed you want, and what you want to do with it. So now let's, let's drill down a little bit more. There's um, a thousand distinct breeds of sheep. So it's, it's not an easy choice. Um, let's say there's maybe 50 breeds in North America, and then you have to kind of figure out, do I want to have a breed that's rare and endangered? That might be kind of a cool marketing thing that I'm going to save a, a certain breed. But we want to really um, think about from a local standpoint, what might be the ease of getting the sheep. Um, Jamie mentioned, um, or Robert mentioned the Suffolk, that is the, the more popular breed, that's the black-faced. The Dorsets are white-faced, the Rambouillet is a white-faced uh, wool breed. The Hampshire is more of a brown-faced, and the Columbia is a white-faced breed. So they, they are varying um, uses of those sheep. So looking at from a, a more local standpoint, we typically in the North Coast have a medium wool, which, is a, which means that wool's usually uh, used for carpets and it's a meat sheep. And so something like a Shropshire or a Hampshire, um, they're more the, the brown faced sheep. They are, they get you both wool and meat, very high quality meat. And then the, the South Down, which you, you guys have probably heard about is the baby doll South Down. So they're the very small, cute little faced um, sheep that um, became popular again for use in vineyards and became very expensive for use in vineyards. And so you want to um, think about um, if I'm gonna make this investment, what kind of breed do I want and what I'm gonna do with the byproducts from those. Um, obviously the hair sheep, um, someone asked a question about that. There are a variety of different hair sheep. Um, 
they're really great. Like I said, you don't have to shear them. They're pretty hearty. They have great meat. Um, and so, and they're becoming more popular, which means they're easier to find. Um, and they're more accessible. So that again, um, helps you uh, to make that decision. So then you're saying, okay, well, how do I decide if I want, um, you know, how many sheep do I get? Uh, Glenn mentioned numbers and stuff. So the stocking rate on the breed is going to depend on the number of acres you have, the time that they're going to be able to graze, and the available forage. So if you only have um, one vineyard, you're only going to need a few sheep. Thinking about that they need about 3% of their body weight and forage per day. So say these little guys weigh 50 pounds, um, they're going to need 3% of that per day. But thinking that grazing only occurs about three to six months of year. So what are you going to do with them for the other six months? Maybe that's when they become in your freezer, they become in your, um, your box plus your case of wine. Um, you know, that you can use them for, you know, just think about, do I want them year round? Do I want them just for this, the grazing season? Um, typically we like to see, um, that the, like I said, the baby doll, uh, the Katahdins are the hair sheep, the St. Croix or the, um, the Dorpers are the hair sheep. So again, if you don't want to get into worrying about wool and shearing, stick to those breeds or the baby dolls, which do need to be um, sheared, but they're the small, smaller ones. So you're still wanting to have sheep. I haven't, I haven't uh, swayed you from something else. So again, now we have to think about the health and management of these, of these sheep and some of you might not be um, sheep producers or know any sheep producers, but typically sheep producers always say that sheep were born to die, which doesn't, isn't a great, um, uh, you know, isn't great for the sheep. It's not, you know, it's not a real sounding endorsement, but they, um, they're great animals. They're very docile. I love sheep. I was raised on a sheep farm. And so the things you have to worry about are obviously nutrition. If you keep these animals healthy, the other two will be less of a problem. So high nutrition, always providing them um, grazing, grazing um, access to, to green grass, or if it's not green, then you're gonna have to supplement them with um, a, hay, uh, a hay or some grain. Reproduction, if you're gonna have year round a lamb supply, then you're gonna have to have ewes and then some, uh, some rams, and then you're gonna have to worry about maintaining that nutrition year round and then dealing with baby lambs. And what do you do with that? And then diseases. Um, if you have a, um, a solid flock and you're not just bringing in you know, um, sheep from every which way and especially not from the auction yard, you, you probably should be okay with diseases. But again, it's something you're gonna to have to be um, part of your management plan is to be thinking about what vaccinations I might need, how am I gonna handle this on a year round basis and keep my animals alive to make sure that they have the right supplements um, and, and proper nutrition. So just some basic things for the next trivia questions. Um, the herd health, normal temperatures 102 to 104. Uh, respiration, that they have uh, 10 to 20 beats per minute. And their pulse, if you're into taking pulses of sheep, are 70, 80 beats per minute. Um, but the real, the real uh, take home message is, is that 95% of flock problems are about 5% of the individuals. And that's where if you have a closed flock or you don't buy sheep from the auction yard, you're going to be uh, better off if you know the source of where you're buying the animals and they're, they're healthy when they get there, they should be fine. So you need to have a sound herd health program. You wanna minimize stress, don't we all? Um, again, the sound nutrition. Um, you wanna have continuous training of personnel. So if you decide you wanna have sheep and you're gonna have somebody work with you, you wanna make sure that they understand and know how to, to work sheep. You wanna have sound sanitation management. So clean water, they're not, you know, if you're gonna have um, lambs, that they're in a, in a warm, clean environment when they're born. Um, you want to have biosecurity. So again, maintaining a closed flock is a really good idea on how you do that. So you buy a, a certain herd and then you always just keep that herd going. Um, don't loan or share animals or tools. So sometimes people like to do sh um, share the rams around. Don't do that. Um, you want early detection and treatment, so um, they'll tell you if they don't feel good, and um, you know, 
isolate those ones that don't feel good, um, shelter in place, if you will, and uh, you know, treat them accordingly. Again, no, have a known source from the livestock that you produce, or that you purchase, excuse me. You wanna keep good record keeping so you, you know who's what. Um, you can see this you here has an ear tag, so good record keeping. Sound relationship with a veterinarian. Uh, sheep production's not a very profitable um, venture unless you do more of the value added, but it is good to have a, a vet that you can contact for any kind of um, questions you might have. And then again, if you're gonna keep sheep on a year round basis, you wanna have a preventative vaccination slash warming program. Those things are, you know, as a livestock advisor, um, always happy to help people set that up. It's pretty straightforward. Again, they don't need a lot of um, vaccinations and worming, but um, you wanna keep them healthy, good nutrition, and um, keep good records. One of the biggest problems with having sheep um, any place, um, in vineyards and a pasture on rangelands is predators. For the most part, the biggest predator issue is coyotes. And most sheep producers have um, gone to using guard animals to help manage predators. Sometimes you'll see llamas with um, sheep. Some people have used donkeys, uh, but in vineyards, uh, typically if you were to have a guarding animal, it would be one of the dogs that um, Glenn mentioned some of the breeds. Now you got to know that their job is, um, it's not eight to five, Monday through Friday. It's more like 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. seven days a week. And their job is to um, bark and chase and protect the sheep. And so they can be a, no a noise nuisance. So if you have neighbors nearby that might not like a barking dog all night, that's something to consider. And you gotta care for these guys. And then they're not gonna graze grass, so you've gotta make sure you feed them and they, they need uh, vet care just like any other dog. Um, so some of the breeds, um, Glenn mentioned, um, we have the Great Pyrenees, the Anatola Shepherds, and the Akbashes are three of the, the more popular breeds. When they, we first got these um, in, um, in use in guardian animals, they were, they were vicious, they were mean. And it got to be where it didn't make any sense to have mean dogs, even from an owner standpoint. And so these animals, these dogs are usually raised with the sheep, know how to protect the sheep. Um, typically there might be more than one, an, one guard animal with them because the coyotes will, will pack up and learn to pull one dog away, but another dog can stay. So again, you, you can get a trained puppy. It's the same kind of thing. They're only as good as the training they had and the breed that's behind them. So it's something to think about. So you've gone, oh, heck no, I don't want to raise my own sheep. Um, so maybe there's something else I, I, you know, I need to think about, um, you know, the landowner, the vineyard manager's consideration. So the job of raising sheep may not be simple and cheaper than other alternatives. So you might want to then say, I don't want to raise my own sheep. I want to think about um, bringing a, a grazer in and maybe eventually moving to having my own sheep, but right away I don't want to have my own sheep. So you bring a grazer in and you have this discussion that you have a shared vision of what you want the landscape to look like. And know that grazing, just like meat and wool, is a business. So we want to make sure that the vineyard managers understand that and that they are um, willing to provide fair compensation for somebody that's going to be providing that grazing service. And on the just as important that the grazing um, service providers understand that you guys as vineyard managers are in the vineyards of um, in the business of growing grapes and making fabulous wine. So there's lots of considerations. So in a grazing enterprise consideration is that you want to make sure that you have, you know, healthy animals. You want to make sure that from an animal welfare standpoint, whether you own the animals or if you're bringing somebody else is bringing in the animals, is there's you want to make sure that the animals are, are treated well, they're um, healthy because you've got an image as vineyard managers to uphold as well, and you don't want, you know, something like a sick sheep out in your vineyard where you might have people coming to your winery. Um, it just isn't a good mix, and so you have to think about um, that uh, from an appearance standpoint. Um, but you also think about you have to contain these animals, so you have to um, provide water 
The supplement might need to be added there. They may need shelter. Uh, you need somebody to help handle them. You're gonna have the predator risk. You gotta worry about transportation. How can I get them animals in? How can I get them out? I don't wanna have a rodeo trying to round these sheep up um, to get them out of your vineyard. Probably not really good for vineyards. And then who's gonna care and supervise? So again, a consideration is that somebody comes and leaves sheep on your vineyard and then they drive away. Who's responsible for taking care of those? Um, obviously containment, you might need a herder. There might be somebody out there at all times. You, um, you have to have fencing because you want to move them around. So it might be permanent, it might be temporary. Um, this, I left this photo in so that you could um, know that this is why we don't recommend goats because goats would not be appropriate in a vineyard because they'd climb all over your vines. Um, but the fencing also to deter uh, the predators. I'm so glad that Robert mentioned this. Um, you need a contract. It's really important so that everybody's on the same page. So you got the landowner and or, and or vineyard manager contract with the grazers. And so, um, you know, you need a job description as far as where they're going to graze, the time frame, what the payment's going to be, um, indemnity clause or bonding. What happens if the neighbor's dog gets into the vineyard and we have some problems. That's not good. Um, what about insurance? It's always good to have insurance. This is, these are businesses, they should have, and, um, and what about natural disasters? What happens if there's a drought or um, we have a fire or we have a shelter in place? Um, you know, what, what do we do in a natural disaster? And, and as these sheep um, are saying, they're just not gonna work without a contract. So the grazing season, and I know Glenn talked about this, um, is that it's gonna depend obviously on timing of rainfall, the amount of rain and the temperature. So when do we put the sheep in? You know, again, it's gonna depend on your, your vegetation management goals. But I, you know, usually see it starts um, anytime around the, from November through January. It might end um, at the bed break because we don't want, um, the sheep eating the buds, which they will do. And so anytime that bud break comes, you know, it could be the end of February through March, you guys know all that. Now, the question is, it was asked earlier, is there a second grazing period? And, you know, it's gonna depend on what your goals are. If you want these sheep to be um, leafing, if you will, and some, um, um, some vineyards are starting to design for that. So what's the vineyard design and will it allow for that? Is that, is that, and is that something that's gonna work for your system? So typically we've got a one se season they come in, but do they come in for a second season? That's kind of what we're thinking about. So, so really what's important to think about um, from a sheep grazing standpoint, whether you own them or you have them coming in, just so we, everybody needs to understand that these sheep need to have kind of a home base. Where do they go after they've grazed your vineyard? Do they go to your neighbor's vineyard? Do they go, you know, do they go home and sit in someone's backyard? It's, they need a place to go when they're done grazing the vineyard. So thinking about, is there more upland or rangeland surrounding your vineyard that they could graze? Could that be a possibility? Could you scale up with neighbor, neighboring vineyards? We have a, a vineyard here that is trying to start grazing and they're gonna they have 50 acres and that vineyard manager went around and talked to all the the vineyards in the area and it could scale up to 150 acres which is great now unfortunately it might be you need the sheep all at one time but maybe you could still work so we could rotate the animals through that 150 so that's um uh, more advantageous for the sheep grazer it's better for the vineyards because it's going to reduce the cost um and so that's that's an opportunity that you might think about um, but home bases are really critical and then there's the vineyard design so it's really you guys know your vineyards you know the design but if you're putting in a new vineyard or you're thinking about i want to graze so some ideas about that think about how wide your vine rows are so obviously the wider they are it gives more grazing areas per acre. So that's a better opportunity for grazers to have more forage for their sheep. And it's easier to cross fence and move the sheep so that they're not so um, space uh, constrained and they might have problems running through the vineyard and ripping up some of your, um, your water lines and stuff. And so bigger, wider vineyards, if you wanna start implementing sheep grazing, there's a good place to start. 
um, cane pruned vineyards and trellis system. So obviously depending on how you prune and how you um, um, have it, the trellis system, it's easier to graze than um, cordon unless cordons have been trained high enough so that they push up um, and so that removes the, any possibility of the sheep touching the spurs in the fruiting area. So maybe if you're going to put in a vineyard and you think you want to have sheep grazing, maybe some kind of designs like this. Again, this isn't my area of expertise, but we've gone out and looked at vineyards and I've taken um, a colleague who is a vineyard manager and a sheep producer. And so these are some of the recommendations that he had um, going forward in implementing grazing. And then the idea of the, the drip irrigation wire, um, when designing, you might want to think about where am I going to put my irrigation line? Because even, even the, the baby doll sheep have trouble getting between the vines, um, between the vine rows. And so you want to make sure that they don't um, get tangled up in that, in that uh, irrigation wire. And so it's best it, that it's at um, 48 inches and it allows the lambs to go between the rows without rubbing or pulling on the poly wire. So again, thinking about that. Um, needed facility and equipment. So you're gonna need fencing, maybe some panels, um, maybe cover if it's gonna be poor weather conditions or it's too warm. Obviously somebody's gonna need a, a livestock trailer to move the animals in and out, water troughs, predator protection, off-season facilities and land. So I just want to kind of um, just show you some of the things that we're doing here locally. Um, this is at, at the Santa Rosa Junior College Schoen Farm where we have a student block so we were able to graze. And so had this had a, a nice combination of using the viticulture students and I was teaching sheep science at the time. The sheep science um, and range students to put up the poly wire and through these vineyards and and do the pre and post grazing just to show um, the use of grazing in a vineyard for a cross section of, of students and then other things that we're doing at, at junior college is that we need to increase the number of people that understand grazing so whether it becomes a business or whether they at least are vineyard managers and better understand when sheep come in what that all entails and so we're working with with um, students and any other interested folks in having grazing schools at the Santa Rosa Junior College. We had one um, last May and we just discussed um, the use of sheep from a grazing perspective and um, how do we train sheep and understanding that depending on what vegetation you have in your vineyard, you know, it might be um, advantageous to uh, think about if I'm gonna plant new vegetation, what might be good for sheep to graze. And sheep do like lots of legumes, the broader leaves. Somebody asked if they liked burr clover. They love all the legumes. You just have to be careful that you have something else in addition to the legumes. If you have just legumes, they have a tendency to bloat and maybe get, um, not. it doesn't do very good for them. So, um, um, it's uh, that little lamb there that was supposed to be a video that doesn't want to run. Um, <laughs> it's just showing that what, what happens is that mama trains the, the lambs. And so mamas eat that, um, those broadleaf, that's chicory actually, that's standing there. And the lambs learn to graze that as well. And so it's really um, important to think about, you know, the whole aspect of, you know, what my objectives are from a grazing standpoint, what my vineyard is right now, how might I implement sheep, do I want to own sheep, what would I do with the sheep on a year round or a seasonal basis, and if I don't want any of that, but I want to bring sheep in, how do I understand and how do I um, connect and um, explain to the sheep grazer what my goals are and what I want and what I don't want. And again, and then also thinking about vineyard design, if I'm going to replace a vineyard, how might I design that so that um, I can um, implement cheap grazing. So with that, I'll, I'll pause and um, ask if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Larson. I really appreciate that. We do have one question. Uh, somebody's asking if you could talk about potential copper toxicity in sheep in organic cropping systems that may build up copper in the vegetation as a result of spraying? Well, that's, um, um, that, so copper is toxic to sheep. 
Um, some people tend to think that it, they can take it at low levels, and I'm, I think that's the case. The problem is, is that it accumulates in their liver. And so you might be able to get away with um, sheep grazing in areas that have copper from um, uptake of, of sprays, as long as there's other vegetation for them to graze. The concern is, is that if there was a chance where they, um, you know, maybe they, they, when they got loaded up, it got, it was hot or they just got stressed. Um, it does tend to um, cause some um, toxicity problems and, and potential death. So it is, it is something to be concerned about. You might want to think about, you know, putting out maybe some other supplements that might counter that, um, that copper. But typically, if you've got um, a, a variety of different vegetation that might not have the similar um, copper uptake, that at least balances that, that diet for them. All right, thank you. Uh, we do not have any more questions for you at the moment. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up for anybody that has questions for any of our speakers. We're coming to the end of the workshop, but we wanna open up the opportunity if anybody has any other questions, just in general. But you guys do that. Uh, Robert, uh, Jamie, do we still have you? Yeah, I'm still here. Jamie okay. is still yeah. We, we had extra questions um, for you and Robert. Uh, let's see here. Uh, people are asking if you do graze almonds. Um, we did in the past, but there's too many, um, food safety issues around that. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we don't typically, we, we do, we have done some walnuts, um, but they're, they're kind of getting worried about the food safety stuff around walnuts as well. So. Okay. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you guys mentioned that you would bring cheese back in June, right? Where the berries are still green. Yeah, we've, uh, we, we've, Shannon, Shannon Ranches has done um, leaf picking for the last several years. Um, we've done a little bit in the past and, and we're going to work on Hold it on. this. Just, just one second. Dr. Larson, you're sharing your screen. Be careful. Oh, thank you. You need to stop uh, sharing the screen. We don't see it anymore. Okay. I just fixed it. It's all good. All right. All right. We're, we're good now. Go ahead, uh, Jamie. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Shannon Ranches has, has been leaf picking the last several years, um, and, and then this year we're going we're gonna to probably integrate it, in, integrate it again as well. Okay. So you really don't have an off-season ride uh, other than when the patio is coming out. So somebody wants to know, what do you do with the sheep when they are not grazing in a vineyard? Um, yeah, Rob, uh, Robert kind of gave our whole, our whole year, we, we leased a couple different ranches. And so if we need to put sheep on those ranches, um, they're, they're open. Um, but we go from vineyards to, um, other cover crops or, um, those, those ranches to kind of go through our ewes after we wean lambs and after grazing the vineyards. And then, um, and they go to, into fire projects in May. And then once the fire projects are done in August, they go uh, to BLM ground and then, um, and then on to alfalfa and then um, back into the vineyards in January. Okay. Sounds good. Um, a couple more questions for you, Jamie. Um, somebody's asking, why is it not recommended to use overhead vineyard sprinklers while we are in the field? Um, well, it one it scares the sheep and they'll uh, they'll get out. It also, um, it, yeah, mostly that's it'll it'll scare them and they'll 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 get out. Um, I think one year when we did that, that happened. Um, we also ended up having a foot rot issue, and I I don't know, you know, it just the it got it was warm and then the the water overhead. Um, but, and it also, if they're, you know, yeah, there, it's just a communication thing. It can, it, it can happen. It's just, if it happens and we're not prepared for it, it can throw some loops. Okay. I have a question that uh, applies for uh, you, Jamie and Robert, and also maybe Dr. Larson. Somebody would like to know, what is the observed life expectancy or health impacts uh, you see in moving the sheep versus having them stationary? 
what's the excuse me again uh somebody wants to know the observed life expectancy or health impacts you see moving sheep versus having them stationary um, I, I got that one okay. uh, so actually i think the life expectancy would is going to be extended on a sheep and the health it will like the health and viability of a sheep is going to be extended. Um, there is a little bit of stress on moving sheep. Mostly it's in the lambs because it's their first time. Our ewes uh, getting on and off of trucks are expected to be, uh, when they come off a truck, they're expecting to come onto fresh feet. So they they run onto the truck, they run off the truck, and uh, I mean, they, they our sheep will load and unload really quickly. Um, the other thing is, is your it, when you set stock and you, and they and they they don't they stay on one property, uh, there there's they're going to develop an immunity to a lot of their those things those properties might have, but they're also going to be uh, re-exposed to parasites uh, mm -hmm. and other issues, uh, other issues uh, pretty pretty regularly. So I would say, health-wise, they're probably going to be. Uh, probably going to be a lot better. All right. Thank you. Um, somebody's asking, I think you touched base on this, but just to clarify, uh, do you need any sort of infrastructure or resources from the vineyards in preparation for you to bring the sheep? Uh, just access to water. Uh, we need we need access to water. Uh, we need um, uh, we need a place to load and unload a truck. So we need to be able to get a semi truck in or out or a pickup with a stock trailer in or out of there. Uh, and we just need to, uh, one of the cool things about sheep is it's the only animal that can convert cellulose, which is grass, into uh, food and fiber. Uh, most other animals only only do one or the other, you know, uh, but they, they, they convert cellulose uh, into food and fiber. So all you need is grass in water. Uh, we do all of our own fencing, uh, so three wire fencing uh, or electric netting, all that we can do. Uh, we just need to be able to get a truck in or out and access to clean water. Thank you. And somebody's asking, do you move the sheep to alternate areas when spraying, or do you prefer that there's no spraying happening at the vineyard while your sheep are there? It depends on the spray. Uh, some some of the sprays uh, don't affect grazing at all, and some of them do. Uh, depends on whether what uh, if your sheep are in gestation if they're pregnant. Uh, but yes, uh, we've found that you need at least an inch of rain or irrigation, sprinkler irrigation with copper, so that you don't get any residual into the sheep. Uh, we have we do graze a lot of uh, you know orchard areas. So you're looking at, uh, you're, you know, you're looking at uh, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of copper in a lot of the orchards, the uh, pear orchards for one like to use copper sulfate for the mold and mildew and a few other things. So uh, we found that about an inch of irrigation or an inch of rain will wash, uh, wash, it, wash, it, wash it off the foliage. Okay. Sounds good. Another question potentially for Dr. Larson as well. Um, can you please clarify why you don't recommend hair sheep for the leaf picking in vineyards? What, what, I don't, what was the question? I'm sorry. The question was, can you please clarify why you don't recommend hair sheep for the leaf picking in vineyards? Oh, hair sheep are fine. No, I don't. I, I think it just depends on if the, the person wants to, um, worry about grazing or sorry shearing the sheep and um taking the wool off but okay. hair sheep tend to be a little bit bigger though so they might be um more problematic in a vineyard okay. um real quick on that, i think our i think our experiences we've had we, they go after um the, with the leaf picking they they they're, they're more they're, aggressive eaters yeah, they're more aggressive on that. Well, what our observation with um, Dorper that we used a couple of years ago. And, and here's the thing is everybody's going to have a different experience with every breed in, in every situation. So don't take anything I say is it's, it's in gold. Um, what works for me, you know, uh, Wooly Weeders down there in Napa uh, runs a lot of hair sheep. 
and they have good luck where I do the same thing and I can't do it for, uh, for the life of me. So the management style that you have with your animals needs to match up with the management style the animal requires. And so uh, I do, it has not worked well for us to have hair sheep in, in leaf picking. Okay. Uh, here's a question for uh, all the speakers. Uh, somebody's asking, does good act practices not allow sheep in orchards? This person has a lemon orchard in Santa Maria, and they understand that good act practices does not allow sheep. Anybody have an insight on that? Wait a minute, one more time. So somebody's asking if good act practices allow sheep in the orchard. They have a lemon orchard in Santa Maria, and they understand that good act practices do not allow sheep. It depends on who you're selling your products to. So uh, if you are going um, fresh market um, and you're going through Costco, or Safeway, or any of these larger uh, grocery store chains, they're going to require that you don't put the animals out there. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a um, pathogen uh, E. coli FDA issue with the manure. Out. If well, yeah, the FDA has just come out with a law stating you can only put on, on it's 90 days. Raw manure is 90 days before harvest, and that's the same with animals. So you can, you can be out there up to 90 days beforehand, but Costco is not going to let that happen, depending on who you're selling your, your products to. Okay. Uh, moving on, somebody is uh, wondering about the ideal age for lamb meat. And also, what does the market for lamb look like right now? And why is it so difficult to find local lamb in the market? Well, <laughs> I can, I'll take that and then I'll punt it to you, Robert. Um, it, it, there's a lot of reasons why it's difficult. <clears throat> a lot of it has to do with the processing, where they get processed. <clears throat> there's just um, nothing local here. They have to go to Dixon to get animals processed because if I'm going to sell my lamb to you, I have to do it um, through a USDA plant. Um, but that's why I talked about the value added piece is that um, it's, it, it's going to pay more money because you're going to have to charge more money for it. But it, that helps you from a marketing standpoint. If you've got local lamb, people want to buy it. It's just it's not that accessible because of um, it, it does cost more money. And the you know, the, the one thing that about going to a, a market, a grocery store is a year round supply. And when you're local into an area, you don't have access to year round supply. You know, your, my grass season is, you know, green grass starts sometime in November to January and ends sometime April or May. And so my fat lambs, you know, to harvest will be coming at the earliest in March and I can maybe drag it into June. Uh, if you've got irrigated pastures and things like that, you can go later, but that adds expense to those costs. Anytime you're out of season uh, from your growing season, you know, from your grass season, it, it adds a lot of expense and people want to go to the grocery store and be able to grab lamb year round. Uh, and in doing so, it, it kind of cuts us out of that supply chain because we, 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 you know, as a company as large as ours, we, we have an incredibly hard time coming up with with feed that'll fatten lamb, you know, grass that'll fatten lambs year round. What is the ideal age for lamb meat? Uh, it depends on what uh, ethnicity you are and what you're looking for. Um, that's a really hard question, and there's a lot of variables in it. Uh, the guy I looked up to was Bruce Campbell, and he told me at 120 pounds. Every pound after that was a waste of time. Um, he liked a young spring lamb, no, no older than eight months. They're really mild flavor, and uh, and they're not over over fat. You're not trimming a lot of fat off of it. If you're in the restaurant trade and food service, you're not doing a lot of trimming. But then you talk. I've talked to some chefs that like to do the trimming. They like to. Uh, they like to. They, they, they like to make. You know, they're like to make render stuff and make other things with the fat. So um, it, it's all personal choice. Okay. 
All right, I think I address all the questions from the audience. If I miss anything, please feel free to email me or email the speakers directly. This uh, will conclude this portion of the workshop. Uh, just a friendly reminder for everybody, the second portion of the workshop will be next Friday, the 24th. Again, we're starting at 8 a.m. in the morning and you have to register for that. Mm -hmm. So there's two separate, uh, there were two separate links for the two separate sections of the workshop. So if you register for this one, that doesn't automatically uh, put you in registration for the next one. If you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to email me, call me, and I'll be more than happy to talk to you. Many, many thanks to all the speakers. Great appreciate your time and sharing your valuable knowledge with us. I hope that everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. And with that, thank, thank you very much, everybody, for coming in. Join us this lovely morning, and hopefully we'll see you again next uh, Friday. And hey, uh, Miguel, just to let everybody know, I did pop yes. the link for registration for the second day for next Friday into the chat, um, and you can find it on our website at naparcd.org. Yeah, I see it at the end, so feel free to... Uh, somebody's asking for my email, so I'm going to quickly type it. If you receive a flyer, my email would have been there, but I just type it into the chat. Uh, my bad, I didn't share it to everybody. Hold on a second. <laughs> And not type this morning, my apologies. Okay, so here's my email, miguel at naparcd.org. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to uh, reach out to me and I'll be more than happy to talk to you. All right, I think we are done. Thank you very much, everybody. You guys have a lovely evening. Enjoy your weekend. Stay safe, stay away from people as much as you can, please.